Welcome to the show, everyone. Welcome to the next live stream. It's been a bit of a while since the last show. I hope you're all okay. I hope you're all well. And we're going to have a great time this evening. It's this evening in the UK, but wherever you are in the world, I really hope you're all well, staying safe, taking the right precautions and looking after each other. Uh, I just want to say hi to everyone and we can get into the show. There's lots of stuff lined up. This is not a wrist shot week, which is what we had uh, last week. This is more of a topic related discussion. And we're going to look at a superb auction catalog from Watches of Knightsbridge, which is something that I did in the past. Uh, be good if you hear me. Can you can you comment one in the in the comments just to let me know if you can hear me okay and then we can get started. I'll say hi to everyone as we are going. Long time no speak. Thanks, Lawrence. Jenks, you can hear me? Superb. Great. Okay, I just want to say hi to everyone. Chi Town, Curtis, welcome. Clive, great having you here. Williams Watches, Brownie, Blue Watch, Rob Smith, Javier, Nine Bolts, Jimmy, Bud Owens, uh, James Conn, you're all here. Blue Shirt, welcome. Toki Vulture, uh, Lawrence again, Jenks, it's so good. Thank you all for joining. Mr. C, Les, Andy, Toki Vulture, I think I said hi already. Yeah, so many of your names. Welcome. Pleasure having you all here. And we're going to have a great time. I'm not going to focus on what's been going on in the world. There's enough of that rubbish going on already. Uh, media has just been going absolutely insane. And I'm, I'm sick of I try and avoid all social media, all news outlets as much as possible. Um, I think at this time, you really just need to take care of yourself as much as possible with uh, what you're eating and keeping your body going. Anyway, let's get into the show. We start off, as always, with the live five. I'll pull these up for a second, take a hit of water, and uh, get going. I want to say hi to a few more of you. There's Jeremiah, Watches and Giggles. Welcome. Uh, let's see, Raymond, awesome. Wrecked, it's great having you here as well. And yeah, it's going to be good. We're going to be doing something a bit different. This is more of the original format. Um, before, like One of the first shows I ever did was looking at the Watches of Knightsbridge catalog. And you'll see in the, in the description of this video, I mention uh, a discussion and review of the upcoming auction from Watches of Knightsbridge. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Let's just start with the watches on the screen. The live five is how we generally start the show, where we look at pieces uh, that caught my attention over the course of the week, and some of these did. Uh, let's start from left to right, and as we get into it, I just want to link all of the watches that are on the screen in the chat. So right now, one, two, three, you should see all of the names of the watches from left to right. So if you'd like to know a bit more information, there's a few reference numbers. Um, things to just get you a little bit more accustomed to what the pieces are on the screen. It's a really nice segment because it warms me up, gets me uh, gets me into the show, talking about design and details. And Bud Owen says, still not sure about the new Bond watch. Yeah, I, uh, I also agree. And there's a great video, by the way. Uh, what is his name? Views from Mark, I think. He's a big Bond fan, and he's just picked up one of these Seamasters, uh, not even a week ago, and he did an unboxing. I think his name is Views from Mark. So have a look at it. Have a look for his channel on YouTube. And he does an unboxing and discusses the piece briefly. I want to talk about the design of the watch a bit differently because, of course, the press photos don't do it justice. You need to see it in a bit more of a three-dimensional light to get a better idea of the details. Anyway, let's get into these pieces and have a chat about this. What's crazy, I didn't even realize, but these five watches are all military-inspired, if you think about it. They all have some kind of military background to them, whether it's uh, dial related or all of those things. And yeah, it just blew my mind. Once I'd put all the images on the screen, I, I realized, whoa, these are all military related in one way or another. So let's get into the pieces. Start with these two, Tudor P01 and the Longines Heritage Classic. Now, uh, I've been working on a P01 write-up this week. I need to say hi to some of you. I, I love... I love how I just get into it, get involved, and then I don't actually, you know, the whole idea behind these shows is that I can be a bit more <laughs> interactive with all of you. So I'll uh, I'll try my best to to say hi. Rob Smith says Seiko P01. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, this, the whole story is um, it's pretty crazy. And yeah, I worked on a write-up on this over the course of the week. I've done the recording. I just need to put some images together and uh, finish. I think I'll finalize the video tomorrow. But it's really good. It addresses the, the creative potential of this watch and just what Tudor was doing. Uh, you can basically you can ask the question almost rhetorically at this point, saying, what was Tudor thinking? 
<laughs> and you can look at it both ways. And uh, it's a cool discussion. I, I talk a bit more about design and development and deadlines and all of that. So I think I'll get that ready for Tuesday next week. Keep your eye out for Tudor P01. I'll call it something like, what was Tudor thinking? So it won't be that difficult to miss. Um, Long Jean Heritage Classic, this watch has been discussed enough. I did a video about this watch two weeks ago. Really put a lot of effort into the design write-up and highly suggest you have a look at it if you haven't seen it. Uh, I go into all the details about the history of the sector dial and uh, just the balance and proportions. And this is arguably one of the most beautiful sector dial watches that has ever been made, uh, especially up to modern day standards. And it's just a stunning piece. I mean, when you think about the history and aviation, it's great. And then next to it, this JLC, this is a really interesting piece. And there's a few models. You have the, you have the deep sea chronograph. You also have the, the deep sea alarm. And these were very important back in the day. I don't know the, the exact time of development. I would imagine uh, late 50s, early 60s kind of era. You can take that from the way the, the numerals are arranged and everything else. But some very quirky little features about this watch. And when you talk about a name from you know, a JLC watch with all of these details, uh, the value of these things are huge nowadays. Um, really interesting piece. I love the, the whole black on black idea. The, the sharp contrast between the elements, balance on the dial, pure symmetry, uh, very aggressive. I mean, it even has needle or syringe styled hands. And this whole, this whole system of being able to engage the chronograph and know whether uh, the chronograph is working, whether it's not working, whether it's ready to be reset, this little visual indicator tells you all of those things at a glance. Really interesting piece. Next to it, and this really caught my attention, I don't know how or when or why, but I stumbled onto it. I think it was on Instagram. I'm really enjoying Instagram as a place to uh, look at pieces. And this is basically a military-inspired dial design. So let's pull these two up. I'll, I'll mention the reference because the chat has moved so fast. Uh, the reference of this watch is a 14790ST. And it's known quite uh, commonly in the community as the military dial. It's so weird, right? Very hip. There was mention, I can see mention in the chat saying, uh, looks hip, looks funky. The one thing that really bothers me about the watch, why would you why would you put the name of the watch on the dial? I mean, if you want to make it tacky, <laughs> do that. And uh, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. I don't understand the thinking that went into that process. But, you know, uh, I'm sure this piece was made in and around the early, early 2000s era. And not all elements work, of course, but I thought it was nice to look at the Royal Oak a little bit differently with numerals around the dial, sort of uh, mirroring the, uh, what's it, the Patek Aquanaut for the most part. Interesting piece, very peculiar, very seldom you see this watch. I thought it would be nice to bring to light. And then we get to the James Bond Seamaster. This is uh, pretty good. Let me pull up a full screen. Hold on a sec. Let's get out of this and pull up a full screen of this watch. Just talk about it briefly before getting into the actual catalog. Where's a good, I'll just type in Seamaster Bond. I always have a little pre-page up ready to go. It's a really peculiar looking watch. And uh, let's see, some light treats the watch better than others, I would say. Uh, just overall, I, we've, we've spoken about it before. Let's, um, sorry, again, I need to catch up with you guys in the chat. There's so much going on. Lots of talk about the AP. Interesting looking watch. Again, if you'd like to catch my attention, please tag me at ID Guy in the chat. I saw Okuzen saying hi. Nice to see you, brother. I got your email. There's so many emails coming in at the moment. <laughs> Lots of people think it's still wrist shot week. Uh, it's every second week, but I'm still getting emails for, for following shows. So I'm having to weed through the emails, you know, as, how it is. Um, okay. And I saw a mention from, from Curtis saying, I tried on a prototype of this Bond Seamaster at the London Old Bridge Street AD earlier this year. Beautiful watch, but pricey. And uh, Peter Wong, welcome to the show. So, okay. We look at this watch and we compare it to the Seamaster from Spectre. I think the Spectre watch did a few things better with regards to its inspiration from past motifs, uh, its, its use of balance on the dial and all of those details. I like the idea. One thing I like about this watch is that it calls back to the original Brosnan era pieces. Uh, you know, it has that, that same aesthetic, but it does also try to make it a little bit more modern in the way it's presented. I can't get it any closer on the piece, but I think they just went a bit too far with the, the faux patina. Um, 
not saying that that's a bad thing, but I think it just it overcrowds the details on the watch. It's sort of when you look at it, it it just covers you with with this caramel brown color. Let's get another image up. Uh, let's see if there's another good one. This is pretty good. This is a more realistic view of the watch. It's a little bit too heavy. <laughs> um, saying that though, I think one of the greatest uh, introductions was the mesh bracelets. They did a great job bringing the mesh in uh, because you get a much nicer vintage inspired sense. It's also great that this watch is made of titanium, much lighter to wear. So even though it has a bit of a larger presence on the wrist, it's much more comfortable because of its weight, lack of weight. And there are a few interesting things they've done, like that the Sapphire has this very, very unique domed effect. Highly recommend you look at the review from uh, Spray on Tan. That's funny, bud. Uh, highly recommend you look at the video from Views. It's, his channel is Views from Mark, and he does an unboxing of this. You get to see it in, in much more dynamic light. Um, yeah, I must say it's personally, I think the uh, the original from Respect to Film was much more well executed because when we talk about a James Bond watch, we want something that's sparse and simple, not something that's so overly technical. Um, this watch would have looked just as terrific if they had kept the idea of a titanium case and bracelet, but then went with just white numerals or just lessened the, the overall freshness of the white and faded it down ever so slightly. I think they may have <laughs> overreached in a few places with this model, but you know, in saying that, there are some nice motifs. I like the MOD trying uh, MOD arrowhead. It's a nice callback to to watch, uh, you know, watches of that time and and all of that. But uh, yeah, if it was me, I'd be jumping on the Spectre model still. I think that has a bit more of a, a timely nature. Uh, this this was very close though. I think they did some good things, but also they they overplayed it in a few areas. Uh, apparently, these aren't limited editions. As far as we know, there's been a few talks about this watch going to be on the shelves. And I mean, in different lights, you can see these pieces manage to play with the light so well. It's all up to opinion, of course. I think they just overdid it. I think on the bezel especially, they should have backed off a little bit there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shaitan says, my issue with the Brosnan Seamaster doesn't look right without its original bracelet. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the bracelet really was that element that tied it all together, gave it that that uh, image on the wrist, you know? Um, this one, a little bit different. <laughs> and this piece would have looked great without the helium valve, I think. The one Seamaster professional that didn't have a helium valve, I think everyone would jump on it just for that reason. Yeah, so strange. It's strange how you can see it in different lighting and get a different feel for it. The dial is also very matte. Anyway, we've spoken about this long enough. Let's get to the actual content of the show. Beforehand, just talk about what I'm wearing. We can briefly talk about quarantine watches if you want. This is a core niche heritage. They are by no means expensive. I picked it up and thought, hey, let's give it a try. I really love the, the whole idea that this piece pays homage to watches like the, the Lunga 1815 and uh, what else? The, the 5170 Patek Philippe. Um, and this piece is on a, a very unique uh, calfskin, European calfskin strap. And it's just so vibrant in the light. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's just a great everyday wearer. And talking about quarantine watches, if we want to just jab, you know, a little bit of a jab in the rib, what we could say about them is they need to be light, kind of wieldy, comfortable. So I think a leather strap is pretty good. And talking about a chronograph, you want to watch with a pulsation dial technically, right? So you can track your pulse, make sure that everything's up to scratch. And I just took some a few shots in different lighting to get an idea of just how well this watch plays. Uh, you have a much more dynamic glow here, and then we get into a bit more off light, and then slowly but surely, you get to see how the how the light reacts with it. And it's it's just gorgeous. The details are amazing. Finishing is great. It's It's got a Seiko VK64, so it's by no means high horology, but it's just, you know, I love it. The, the wearing experience is also great. It looks huge on my wrist here, but it fits so well. 39 mils, really comfortable. 20 mil lug width, so it takes all the straps and uh, interesting inspiration. Uh, and also the, the color contrast. If I just pull back to the first image again somehow, let's see, will images help me here? This calf skin, oh, it just completes it for me. It makes the blue stand out so much more. Very, very vibrant. Okay, there's a few more comments. And again, if you want to catch me, tag me in the chat and I hope to, to get 
a hold of it. Let's see, Sanford says, I've always believed that there is too much placed on the word patina. Uh, if the watch could be seen as simply being tan or brown, it would remind you more of a military uniform from World War II. True. Uh, the whole the whole use of patina and faux patina is a little bit overkill at this point. I agree. And uh, old radium loom would date it terribly, Eric says. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's to each their own opinion. I think they could go a little bit too heavy with it. But in saying that, it's, I mean, talk about the movement in the watch and all of that. It's it's great. Many pieces are locked in the bank, probably won't be accessible soon. I heard that story, Nine Bolts. Uh, apparently, there's this whole debacle. Since the film is delayed, they're not releasing the watches. And some people got early birds before even the ADs. <laughs> they got their watches in the post. I mean, it's fantastic. You could probably sell them for double the price. Okay. So, welcome, everyone. I'm sure there's a few more of you who are joining. Uh, so, I'm really enjoying this piece. Very nice wearing experience. Love it. Jumping to the content of the show. And again, it's a bit different. This plays back to how the channel used to originally do its live shows before we had um, Wrist Shot Week and more topical uh, discussions. This is a catalog from Watches of Knightsbridge. They're based in London. And I've done a few of these before. It's basically a auction house. They have an auction going on the 28th of March, which is next weekend. Saturday. And it's fantastic because they have a PDF of their catalog and it's available. You can download it and just page through it. There's like what, a hundred and something pages? A hundred pages exactly. And in here we get to see everything from modern to vintage, all the watches in the line. So what we can do is slowly but surely page through this and discuss the watches ever so briefly. I can say hi to you in the chat. We can just get a conversation going. If you'd like to ask me a question about a watch, I can always pull it up and we just keep the, the dialogue going that way. Uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice way to take your mind off things, I think. And the photography is just incredible. I love it. So it's almost like us sitting and paging through a magazine together as a group. So we can enjoy it together. Um, so first off, this piece, what is it? It's an AP, I think, pocket watch. 18 karat solid white gold diamond AP skeletonized pocket watch. I don't know how many of us are interested in diamond encrusted <laughs> pocket watches nowadays, but uh, hey, it's up. Uh, and as we get through, I would say by the halfway point, we start getting to watches like, like Tudor and Rolex and Omegas. And it's great. I mean, the watches they have on offer are superb. I am by no means sponsored by them. I'm not here to uh, promote their stuff by any means. I just love the photography and it's great seeing all these little details on the screen. So I hope you can catch in and join in and yeah we'll get it rolling we have been running for how long already 17 minutes that's insane okay so we can just page through these slowly but surely royal oaks the usual two tones uh, the prices should also be on the screen so i hope you can catch the prices as well if you're interested in all of this uh, of course this is all just photography that we're enjoying at the end of the day uh Chaitan saying rocking my save the ocean turtle yeah it's cool i'd actually love to talk about it I, the, the idea of using that blue uh, for that special edition. I think it's great. It's a nice choice. It's got a lot of meaning behind it, you know? Um, yeah, so there's some peculiar watches here too. This 50 Fathoms on the left, uh, dated 99. What does it have? A white gold bezel? Uh, I'll also repeat, I haven't um, looked at these before the show. This is me just sitting here browsing what's on offer at the moment. Uh, haven't had any time to look at these today. I've been quite busy. We have a dual time on the right-hand side. You don't see 50 fathoms like these anymore. Uh, I can't read what it says here. Gentlemen, stainless steel. So this is just stainless steel all the way through. Bezel, very nice layout though. I mean, this this has really become the, the element that ties the whole Blanc Pond line together nowadays. Uh, it's really cool seeing it on display. This is a little bit more peculiar. You just never see these watches, you know? Uh, what era is this from? 2001. <laughs> Strange use of balance on the dial. How often do you see these, these World War I inspired uh, cathedral almost uh, numerals on the dials of these pieces with a day night indicator? Uh, looks like you have 24 hour time and a sub seconds. God, that's peculiar. For a dive watch, you would think you need a little bit more attention to detail. <laughs> we have Ladies Blanc Pond. I don't know what this is about. So we'll slowly but surely go through this. Ladies Bulgari, uh, very, very peculiar. Of course, you have these crazy fashion watches. Uh, you know, I'll just leave this on the screen for a second while I catch up to a few more. Shaitan saying, I would go with the Blanc Pond, but prefer my 
my bread whole wheat. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, slowly but surely, we're going to get through all of these watches, and I think I will speed it up at a point and get to some more interesting pieces because I don't know how interested we'll be in in ladies' quorum watches with with emeralds and diamonds and pink crystals and all of those details. So let's just browse through these briefly. Uh, if any of you are keen on ladies' watches, let me know, and <laughs> we can stop. Uh, but yeah, what what make is this? Um, Taba. Can't say I've ever heard of that brand before. And we got some Cartier with pearls and golden lays. I hope you can see this okay. I'm trying to fit this on the screen. Looks like it's going pretty well. Uh, we got some gold. Sizes are extremely small, as you can imagine. These are all ladies' tanks. Moving to the next. Let's see. Oh, dear. Of course, because it's such a high-res file, my computer might take some time to catch up. Now we have some more interesting pieces. These Basculant tanks are really interesting, especially when you consider that they were competing with uh, the Reverso in, in around the same time. <laughs> Pearl bracelet, Turkey Volta said. Yeah, it's not a very good look. <laughs> um, considering that, that the Basculant, and this is the watch I'm talking about on the right-hand side, this was competing with the Reverso. Obviously, it was nowhere near as much successful. What did I say? It's nowhere as successful as the Reverso was when it came out. But this watch really is important to the family. And I do love the story of how it works. It's a crazy little mechanism. Also nice seeing how the, the cobochon is integrated onto the top of the dial and you have this little crown. I mean, watches with crowns, generally crowns should be out of the way nowadays when you're dealing with a watch that is um, automatic. How often do you wind it? Yes, it does flip, Sanford. Uh, it flips. It's it basically, it, you can either rest it at a vertical position on your bedside or you can flip it completely like a tank. It has a couple of rotating pinions. and I think it has one one axle. It has one axle that connects the base and then one axle that connects the, the underside of the watch down. So it's a really interesting little mechanism. Whoa, magic mouse. Whoa. <laughs> um, there's, there's a few videos on the watch uh, on YouTube. So have a look. There's, there's a few discussions about the piece and how it works. Really interesting mechanism. Of course, what makes it problematic is that when you use something like that, there's lots of room for failure. Uh, you know that all those articulating points can be damaged, can break, uh, and that's why the reverso is so much more effective. It's, it only consists of you know, a few moving parts. I love talking about the reverso. Very interesting watch. Then we get to this piece, and what I love is the photography gets super. When, when the watch is focused, uh, we get a much greater image of the watch on screen, and this is a jumbo automatic from the 70s, 18 karat solid gold. I mean, this is the typical tank, but you never really, you never see this watch without blue hands nowadays. It's kind of peculiar, right? Uh, solid gold hands, as well as case and everything else. And the nice thing about these photos is that you get to see all the details and the scuffs and the wear. Um, one thing that I, I kind of appreciate from the way Watches of Knightsbridge presents their stock is that they by no means baby the watches in the photos. They don't doctor the watches. They have all the scratches and dents and scuffs on them, so it's well worth looking through. And I'm just slowly but surely scrolling through all of these pieces. These are more ladies' pieces here. Um, and now we get to some more vintage-inspired chronographs. Don't worry. It gets much better by the time we get to the, the halfway point. I think I will just flick through these a little bit faster. So we have, the, what is it, a Breitling top time. Uh, let's see. Gold-plated. <laughs> Look at the price difference. When we actually compare solid gold to gold-plated of the time, these are 60s and 70s references. It's so peculiar. Yeah. So that's nice. Everyone's listening to me. That's cool. I hope everyone's okay. I hope you're all fine and well and looking after yourselves and enjoying watches. I think the main subject that I wanted to focus on is that watches generally are such amazing distractions for all of us. And this is a time when we can just sit back and, and kick back and look at what's around. Uh, not so much, it's not as directed as something like Wrist Shot Week, which is more personal, but it's nice seeing the level of variety that's on offer around the place. So this, these are 1969-1970 Breitling pieces. Uh, you can tell that the motifs were very much 70s inspired back then with the handsets and the use of the subdials. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's up everyone's alley, but the subdials are so peculiar. Let me pull in and have a look at this one here the red hands and the and the crazy looking dashboard it's amazing how automotive design really 
uh, was was translated across into the watchmaking field back in the day. I feel like automotive design had a huge impact on all industries back then. Um, and it's it's crazy how even it looks pretty dated nowadays when we see it, but uh, back then it was it was the hot item. And uh, as mentioned, you're saying that the t it's a tag Hoyer copy, I think, and that might have to do with the movement in this piece. No, I don't know if if these brands were sharing similar movements back in the day, but this looks like a caliber eleven, which was used with the Monaco and and a few other pieces in the family at the time. Strange. All of these pieces actually look at that. They are very much playing to the to the strengths of the Monaco from the same time period, uh, with the cushion style cases and all of that peculiarity. Oh, magic mouse, are you going to help me? So here we have a Breitling top time. This is a bit more interesting, uh, from 1973. Gorgeous looking dial, and the top time was did a video this week about James Bond and his watch that he used, uh, Omegas and Rolexes and focused on them primarily. But the Breitling Top Time was, you, you could say, arguably the first gadget watch used in the Bond film. Uh, it was used in Thunderball, and it was given to him by Q at the beginning of the, of the film, and he had to do some reconnaissance under a yacht, if I remember. And it had a Geiger counter inside it, and he was trying to detect a bomb or something. I can't remember. I love Thunderball. It's one of my favorites. But the Top Time is a really important watch to the family. There should be a, a further discussion on this piece and its history and all of that. Interesting 24-hour dial, very militaristic inspired. And I love these details. Check the, check the quarters, vertical batons to fill the space and see if my mouse does a, gets enlarged. This is very interesting. Good use of space. And it's maybe on a dial like this, it looks kind of cluttered. But it would be good to see military-inspired elements translated you know, in and around the time in the 50s, they, they were kind of lax with the way they, they put numerals on their dials. Uh, 1973, interesting watch, like the color set. Yeah, I've got to flick through these because it's going to be a long show as it is with all the watches on offer, but it will get better as we keep scrolling. So uh, there's a few chats addressed to me. So let me try and catch you before it disappears completely. Um, Ninebolt says, I've been to their auctions. They have a couple viewing days and you can go in person to really study the watches. I bought a Speedy there. Interesting. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I, I don't stay anywhere near Knightsbridge, but it's it's a very interesting, uh, I think the way they do it as well, they, they actually run the auctions via social media fully. Um, so they, they actually run the full auction as a live show that you can catch up and you can follow on your phone it's just brilliant. I mean, very good use of the platform. And just follow, if you are on Instagram, follow them because the photos they take and share are superb. And it's just great. You know, we always, we always love our watch porn most of the day. Uh, Peter Wong says, yeah, I love Thunderball. It's such a good film. It's, it's my favorite Bond film of all time, I think. Uh, I love the, the atmosphere. I've said it a few times, actually. It was a Geiger counter. Thanks, Chi Town. Um, I love the atmosphere, the, the idea that Bond is in the water with scuba gear, gets to use his watches, and uh, it's just it's just the best. You know, enjoy it so much. Navi Timer, what's this? 2006, 1970s. The Navi Timer is a watch I haven't discussed at all. Lot 40, and this is the watch on the right hand side here. Very interesting. Uh, this is not how we typically see the Navi Timer nowadays. You can correct me. I mean, you need to be pretty well learned in the field of Navi, Navi timers to understand all of these pieces because I am I'm by no means focused on these watches. I need to do more discussions around these and study up, learn a bit more. But look at that gap between the 70s on the left and the 2000s on the right. I mean, which is the more legible watch? The, I mean, the, the complete uh, poll goes towards the 2000s reference. And the navigation bezel is soon sweet Akuzen says, it's a peculiar thing, having a slide rule on your watch. When would someone need this on an everyday basis? I, and you have, to, you have to learn a lot of, you know, how to actually use it as a chart and all of that. Mark P, welcome. Great having you here. No, you're not late. We are just slowly but surely running through all of these. Uh, lots of watches on offer, and I'm just enjoying the catalog. Oh, this is a beautiful combination. This is a 1967, and the reference, a cool little story here. Uh, it's a reference 806. So this is pretty much in line with what we know from back in the day. Um, purchased from NAAFI, British Military Suppliers in Bahrain. Original guarantee booklet purchase receipt. And they're expecting it to go between three and 4,000. That is so peculiar. Beautiful. I love the mesh on this. How good does that look? 
mesh bracelets, simple plots. It's 8806, so this has an incredible movement, right? Uh, I'd, I'd like to know, I think Clive is, is quite well versed with these watches. Maybe the Wrangler can tell us about the movement in this piece. Does it have the fancy movement that everyone talks about? And for the price, it's pretty impressive, no? Uh, Peter Wong says, how about a look at Breitling's? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, Super Oceans, there's a few pieces. And talking about buying my first watch, uh, I am going to look at, I think in part two, I'm going to start focusing on more uh, outlying brands like JLC. I want to look at Breitling. There's a few more Rolex pieces that I'd like to discuss. So hope that gets going well. It's just the preparation, you know. I don't know if you saw the first part of the the whole wristwatch buying experience, you know, me looking at different brands. Uh, when was it? Thursday, I put it up. But that was all written. It wasn't uh, just an ad lib discussion. That preparation took a lot of time. And I hope you, you got to see my, my loves and hates for each brand that I looked into. Rolex, Omega, Tudor. It was a lot of fun to put together. It's interesting when you put watches against each other in a family. Um, what do I think of the 765 AV Panda, Dalton says. Let me pull that up. I didn't know they made a Panda variant. <laughs> I mean, I'm that behind with Breitling. I mean, if you want anyone, Breitling and Seiko, I am useless. So it's a 765 AVI Panda. I don't know if it's AVI or AVI. Okay, yeah, I have seen these before. I have a feeling that this watch is actually on the show somewhere or another. I mean, it is, it is beautiful. So the only difference is that this watch has just a, a would you would you call it a panda because it's it's an inverse panda wouldn't you say? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, how often do you see Navi timers this simple? You know, um, love that contrast. You can read the dials so easily. I think the one element that at least I've learned from the AVI series is that this whole sub dial arrangement with those five separate batons really cleans it up nicely. You get a good sense of just where your sub this is your running minutes where that is relative to uh, the hands on the dial. It's extremely simple though. When we compare it to a watch like the, the 765 that we've been seeing lately, and of course that's a super low res image, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, there's something very interesting about the combination of elements here. I, I actually much prefer the numerals on this model compared to the batons. But saying that, this is probably much more in line with traditional inspired watches of the time, uh, talking about uh, what the Blancpain, no, not the Blancpain. Actually, the Air Command is an example, but I'm thinking of the uh, the Longines Heritage, not Heritage, Longines Big Eye. All of these watches have a similar kind of feel. Love the idea that the bezel is usable and you can, you can wear it and, and have that countdown element as well. Cool looking watch, thanks for the suggestion. And there's a talk about First Omega in space. I think it is a great piece. I mean, of all the Speedmasters, that would be the one I would gravitate towards by far. I've actually handled, I've handled a few, uh, handled some vintage ones. And I must say it wears so much better than the professional for me. I think the professional is, it's got a great amount of presence, but it's also a little bit oversized for, for my wearing experience at least. Um, but the 42 mil is a classic and I love that, that super case, you know. Okay, so let's keep going through these. Um, this is a circa 1940s Breitling on the left, waterproof with a clamshell chronograph movement. This is old, this is 1930s, really interesting. I loved what they did with the way they arranged their subdial in the center back in the day. I actually want to do a video about this piece, just about the idea of this arrangement and how you track the chronograph hand through these concentric circles. It looks like the golden ratio in a way. Maybe that's where they got the inspiration from. But it's, it's a fascinating combination. And then just when we sit back and look at the colors, the, the contrast between the reds, the blacks, the whites, how easy the watch is to separate. You can look at every element individually without uh, having to focus too much. It's amazing, actually. Very good use. And they used a telemeter bezel back in the day because, of course, this watch was probably used to time shelling and uh, how far projectiles would go using the speed of sound. Uh, interesting watch, and I, I do love World War I era pocket watches. It'd be nice to look at them in more detail as well. And then we have some glycines, original pieces. Left, on, left of the screen is a 1955, and on the right, a 1966. And uh, the airman needs to be discussed as well. What I love about these streams is that I can jump back and catch up with uh, subject ideas if I'm feeling a bit of creative block. It's nice to to look back and see what was spoken about. 
Glycine Airman needs a show by itself. And have there any been have there been any more questions directed to me? It's great. Mark P uh, is doing well. Uh, nice, nice to watch and think about something different. Yeah, Mark, that's that's the idea. I think this is a time when we can just enjoy the hobby and, and get into it. I've definitely been using this as a distraction uh, for a lot of times. And watches are just amazing distractions. I mean, that's really the, the theme of the show, really, as we go through. Uh, then we have uh, another Glycine Emin. This is the 70s. I mean, you, you don't even have to look at the, the timeline to see what this watch is. And on the right, we have a Gigande. I hope I said that right. Gigande, Gigagne. Um, don't know anything about this brand. It's it's been and gone, but it's it's crazy how all of these brands were around back then, and how some have some have done exceedingly well, and others have just disappeared into into the unknown reality. We have a Jacques Dro on the left, and we have a what is this? A Nevada, oh Nevada Gretchen. Oh geez, wow, interesting. Both from the seventies, and these seventies watches are so polarizing. I don't think I don't think you can get more polarizing watches in the world. Uh, when we look at the 70s inspired pieces with their colors and, and all of those details, uh, you either love them or hate them. There's there's no real divide down there. Okay, carrying on through. We've got lots of pieces up and it's gonna get better as we go through. We've got some Doxa subs, some originals. Uh, the one on the left is from 67, the one on the right is 68. And I actually have a footnote telling myself to do a write-up on Doxa and the sub and the history and just what it has done, how it used, uh, it was, I would say it was one of those watches like how we see watches today, um, what's a good example? Like Ming watches or FP Jean, how they've used like, like uh, social media and all of those platforms to propel their names. These pieces used icons of the time to promote their watches. And as we know, Jacques Cousteau loved this piece. And it's amazing just how uh, a watch like this got into the mainstream because of it being worn by someone popular at the time. And yeah, it's, it's cool. It's a great use of marketing. And I mean, this watch is entirely unique to itself. And again, it's polarizing because it has a cushion case. It's got these just heavy 70s markers. But they're doing some great stuff. They're making some awesome pieces. And uh, I do need to look at them more. Just the standard watches that they offer nowadays, it's well worth discussing. I also love the way they've placed their, I mean, look at that. That's a brilliant use of space. The way they've put their typeface there and offset it from the base. It's simple, effective. Uh, of course, like I said in the beginning, uh, watches of Knightsbridge don't baby their images. So this watch has been scratched to pieces, but at least <clears throat> you get a more rounded idea of what the watch actually looks like. And going further down, we have Yema or Yema. I don't know how to pronounce the name, uh, but they're also, it's got an amazing history. These chronographs were on par with, with Hoyer and, and other names back in the day. They were given out as awards. Uh, there's so many watches in this category from the, from the 60s and the 70s that are kind of lost to time and only are really known about by enthusiasts nowadays. Okay. Let's see what else is next. I, I'm, I'm with you on this journey. I really don't know what's up on the show. Okay, here we go. Got some more chronographs. It's what I like about the way they present their catalog is that they go from everything uh, 60s, 70s related, and then they jump to more field watch related pieces. They have their separate segments, you know. Uh, on the left, we have a Galet, and on the right, we have a Excelsior Park. <laughs> uh, circa 1960 on the left and 1950 on the right. I mean, these dials are just so simple. Uh, interesting that they look more like watches from the fifth. I mean, especially the one on the left looks like more of a watch from the the fifties uh, than you would think for a sixties era piece. And of course, uh, as I've learned over this time, these brands were really uh, sharing dial manufacturers at the time. So there is no knowing what was allowed, what wasn't allowed. As we get to the more Ministry of Defense related things, we can start seeing how watches fell into a certain category. Uh, okay, let's catch up with all of you here. Uh, what uh, Wisconsin Watch Guy says, I hope it's Wisconsin Watch Guy. We Watch Guy. Yima Yotograph, great, really cheap price. I have to look at those. I need to look at Yima as a brand as well. And Mario Andretti, great story about it. And I think it was awarded to him, Sanford. Actually, it's in the, it's in the book, is it? 
I don't know if it's in this book, A Man and His Watch, or if uh, it was just an award given to him for an Indy 500. I think I remember the story back there. So we're going slowly but surely through all these. Let's see what else is going on. We've got a doxer on the left from the 40s with a Valjoux movement. And on the right, we have a Hoya from the 40s. A Hoya was so important. And I actually have a few footnotes telling myself to focus on the uh, just the standard Carrera line and have a discussion around them and just how impactful they were. Because it's amazing. I mean, Hoya in the in the early in the late 60s and 70s, they were on fire. No one could touch them. In the in the stopwatch realm, and the whole idea of stopwatches and chronographs, it's amazing, you know. Uh, and talking watches, yeah. You know, Lawrence says, I think that's where I saw the discussion with Andretti. And here we have some Ottavia Hoyas. I mean, this was Hoya in their heyday, 1970s. They had just released their Caliber 11. I'm trying to remember back to that history. The way you can tell it's a caliber 11 is the way that the the pushes are arranged across from the crown i think that wasn't that wasn't so much an aesthetic choice but it was just the way the movement was made because we know the history they were in competition with brands like um i'm drawing a blank here for the first automatic chronograph the zenith el primero and uh amazing i mean hoya hoya technically did it first uh, and the otavia i mean the joseph fur is the one we normally look at which has a blue a blue highlight on the dial, but the orange is also striking, very much tied up to the 70s period. They call it the orange boy. And there's a message from We Watch Guys saying, great thing about the Otavias, are they all different? Yeah, you know, their color schemes, it's amazing. And they don't overplay it too much. They keep it simple enough that you can look at it and feel like you're getting a, a splash of color, but not you know, a huge amount that, that makes it too polarizing. And the bracelets, everything about these watches, they were superb at the time. Look at the one on the left. So we have a Silverstone on the right, and we have a Montreal on the left. And this was when we got more deep into the 70s. We started seeing, we moved from cushion cases to more TV-styled cases. The Silverstone is beautiful. We look at this watch now on the, on the right-hand side, and we could say that this watch has been able to transcend time much better than, than most, actually. Think about the Apple Watch and all of this, this modern smart trend that's going on. This looks like quite your contemporary smartwatch. It's, it's a beautiful looking piece, right? I think the, the integrated bracelet was quite a revolutionary thing from the time. That's something that everyone tried to, to incorporate. The idea of how the, the strap integrates underneath the case so you never see it, you don't have lugs. It's just clean and simple. As a racing chronograph, this is beautiful. What a stunning looking watch. And the burgundy color as well, you know? What do they offer this for? Between five and six grand for this watch. Very interesting combination of elements. Uh, this really does look like a watch that has been able to move through time gracefully. Compared to the one on the left, not so much. Still has a bit more of a cushion case aesthetic than a TV, TV case, you know? Uh, Great though. I mean, this is what's awesome about watch design is you can really break up all the elements that you've learned over time and try and create some kind of synergy with the way you present. Uh, let's have a look. These are Carreras and these are from the 70s. These aren't your iconic Carreras, but we will get to them now. I'm sure uh, the next slide we will see a very fancy, you know, the Carrera that we all know and love. Um, let's see what else is going on. Silverstone has such an unusable usable shape. Yeah, I agree, bud. Very interesting piece. Great thing about those watches like the Montreal Silverstone Monaco, named after F1 races. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> it's great. Uh, I didn't even think about that. I, I always just thought Monaco and, and that's where it stayed. But uh, they had a whole range and they were doing so well at this time. And then, of course, Quartz Crisis hit. Look how weird this is. This looks like a sub seconds that's running at the 10 o'clock position on this Carrera. Let me try and center this for you. How often do you see a sub seconds that's offset and out of the way? We can see that these watches really are deep in the 70s with the way that they are arranged. Uh, very peculiar use of subdial space, kind of hip, but uh, yeah, it doesn't really stick a landing as well as, oh, here we go. We get to the better Carreras now as we move along. I mean, the real Carrera that we all know and love had such a simple, basic, uh, no, like, no complication on its, on its dial. And I think, I'm pretty sure the next slide will give us a good one. Here we go. This is what we're more used to. And just the reference number, it is A, 1960s reference 2447T. If that means anything to you, uh, it's rare, apparently. Uh, 
interesting looking watch, red dial. This is how we recognize the Carrera. You know, I don't know so much about the beads of rice bracelets, but the case design and shape, the no nonsense dial layout. We could argue that that uh, Hoya and the Carrera line created such a big impact just by the way they arranged their dials on their watches, because people were still very confused about chronographs uh, in the sporting space. And I mean, how similar does this look to watches of the time that were competing? Like, uh, let's just say the Speedmaster from the 50s and uh, the Daytona. I mean, this looks like a direct Daytona dial, but, you know, Hoya nailed it. And again, I'll emphasize Hoya did so well at the time. And there was a mention from We Watch Guys saying the 90s reissue, 90s reissue Carrera is a great looking watches. There are some awesome pieces from the family on offer. Of course, you don't buy them for their potential to be looked after and uh, gain any kind of value. These pieces, on the other hand, they had some really pioneering movements. I, again, I'm not well versed with the movements on these watches, but very good. Uh, Shaitan says that the Hoya is like the Lancia of watch companies. That's a very good analogy. I would, yes, I would agree. Um, if you know cars, Lancia were just dominating in the rally space back in the day. Uh, they had the Integrale, they had the Stratos, the 806, what is it called? Ah, I'm not, not that well versed in my cars lately. But Lancia as a name, they were just destroying the space until cars like the Audi, Audi Quattro came in. So yes, that's a very good analogy. Well, thank you for that, Chaitan. Uh, beautiful little Croya um, Herrera. <laughs> and then we have a few more Otavias from the 60s. And over here on the right, this is the most peculiar. We're talking about Silverstones and all the other models, the Monaco and the Montreal. Then we have the Camaro. I, you know, this is when uh, I kind of got lost with Hoya. When they started introducing a watch like a Camaro, I thought, you know, what, what was that about? Um, peculiar. I mean, these, I, it's, it's strange that the 70s period, it doesn't feel like, we could say, yes, they had a very clear design language with the way they used highlights and all of these strange motifs. But then all of a sudden, we jump back to this really rigid cushion shape uh, case. And you kind of go, so what was the thinking here? Um, are they trying to be more TV inspired, you know, TV case inspired? Or are they looking more to uh, past references like Panerai inspired cases? I don't know. The 70s was a weird time for watch design. I think we can all agree there. Um, oh, this one on the right. I mean, this, this to me is the Carrera. Let me try and get right in. This is a 2008. Whoops. Oh, magic mouse. Help me out here. This is a reissue in 2008. And this to me is the Hoya Carrera. I mean, if you want one chronograph, this does a pretty good job. You know, <laughs> Truth Fear says tag Morocco. <laughs> That's funny. Um, this is just stunning. I think this is what really made the Hoya name famous with their Carrera line. Simple, no nonsense, easy to read, extremely legible. And this is what put their watches on the map. I mean, the sales with, with these pieces uh, back in the day, they were the go-to watch for anyone who was in the race, the racing space, you know? It says 2008, but looks like a 90s reissue. Let's have a look again. Dated 2008, Tag Heuer re-edition with original guarantee instruction booklet. Yeah, that's the problem. They really abbreviate the, the descriptions here, so we can't really get a, a good, clear look. Here's another Camaro from the 70s. Yeah, but that one on the right, I mean, that does it for me. That is the Carrera for, for my taste. And then we jump across. We've got a Morocco here. <laughs> and they had so many models. I mean, what is this, a 2008 reference? This is definitely not what we know when we see the Monaco. Uh, this is a Golf reference. You can see it has the Golf logo, but that is just so tacky. It just doesn't work at all. <laughs> uh, speaking subjectively, it just, why would you do that to a Monaco? Um, the simple layout of the Monaco made it such an, an interesting watch of the time. Love the contrast and the highlights and the use of colors, uh, but, but that blend doesn't work very well. And then on the right, we have a model, what's this, a 2005 Zenith El Primero base. Very interesting. Um, Hoya Monza, again, talking about Formula One. Uh, it's use of sword hands. I mean, this reminds me of an IWC pilot watch. How peculiar is that piece? Okay, catching up to the chat, there's a few... There's a few chats coming towards me. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for the chat. Uh, Tag Hoyer just closed their company. Is that so, Ryan? I'd like someone to confirm that. That's a little bit, it's a little bit nuts. I have heard that a few, 
a few companies have delayed their production for a little while because of this scenario. And yeah, just talking about this bug, I think the whole social distancing idea needs to be implemented much harsh, much more harshly because if we then spend the next two months without having to go into public spaces, the the rate of infection will drop so much dramatically. And uh, you know, uh, might as well you can't you can't really look at things in hindsight, but um, I hope everyone is doing well. Beverage check from Okuzen. I'm drinking a double coffee and a bit of water. Nothing, nothing special today. No alcohol at all. I'm just going slowly but surely through this. I really wanted it to be a laid back chat tonight. I didn't want it to be too preachy and, and lecture, lecture related, but you know, um, we watch guys saying the reference on that 2008 one was the same used in the 90s reissue. I think it was just bought years later. Okay, but the same. Great because it's 35 mils. Yeah, and size with chronographs. I mean, they were using, they were making them in like 36 back in the day. Imagine a 36 mil chronograph today. It's just nuts. We have a Bremont on the left, and they call this the Zulu. Doesn't look like much of a Zulu to me. And then on the right, we have a Soka 1990 IWC engineer. This looks small. This looks like a 36 mil reference. And the engineer, I need to do a video about as well. It would be good to, to discuss the watch in more lengths and just how it competed with watches like the, uh, the Vacheron 222, uh, AP Royal Oak, and Nautilus. I'm so sick and tired of talking about the Royal Oaks and the Nautilus, the Nautili nowadays. <laughs> okay, now we get to the more interesting stuff. We get to JLC. I'd love to talk more about JLC when I do my searching for my next watch brand. Uh, and just look at the more obscure watches. You know, we talk about reversos and everything, but go into a bit more detail there. Okay, so let's see from Sanford. Price of the Bremont should be price of all Bremonts. Yeah, I, I really don't understand the brand. As, as far as I know, you can get a Bremont for like four thousand pounds, and it's got an ETA movement. I think that is just out of this world. Why? I mean, why mark up your watch so high and chart? You know, for something so basic. Uh, and then get limited sales out of it. Why not make your watch cheaper, more attainable, so you can sell more stock? I don't know. Brumont. Okay, thanks, thanks, we watch guy. <laughs> um, and but I'm saying, am I crazy? I want the the, the Brumont Kingsman. It is a cool looking watch. I would pull it up, but we've got so much going on here. Zulu Time, 24 hour from Nine Bolt. Is that the case? Is that why they call it Zulu Time? I've learned something new. Thank you. And I'm from South Africa, so I should know that kind of stuff. No. Um, Emirates watch. How about the Tudor Monte Carlo? Tudor Monte Carlo is a, is a strange beast. I think we'll have one on, on the show, actually. The, the variety on here is insane. You'll see lots of different pieces as we go. I think there is a, an original Monte Carlo on here as well. So we will get there in a second. And when we talk about Rolex, it's all here. So don't worry. Uh, the next, I'd say in the next 20 minutes, half an hour, we will have Tudor and everything up, up on the screen. So uh, JLC Master Control Moon, we know this watch is from the 20s. This has been featured on the show before. I think it's a really interesting piece. Huh? Love the balance on the dial and the idea that you have these beautiful windows that are well set and spaced. I also love it when a hand is used to function as an external element. So in this case, being used for the date complication. And then on the right, this watch is spoken about a lot. This, this geographic, it's becoming quite the cult favorite especially in our community. It's becoming extremely popular. And I mean, uh, what is not to like about just the idea of a dress watch that has a complication like this, you know? Why are JLC watches so undervalued? Uh, it's just because no one knows about them. It's, it's very much, I would say it's kind of linked to marketing in a way. Uh, you just know that people back in the day, the pop culture times, no one was wearing JLC. They were all wearing Rolexes and Amigas and everything. Um, but again, the whole dress watch idea, the dress watch industry, as we know, it's it's not exactly as popular as the steel sports watch. People want something that is rugged and robust. At least that's me as well. Um, I, I see a watch and I want to wear it every day and know that I can do whatever I want with it and not have to worry about all of that. Problem with the dress watch is unless you are someone who wears a suit every day, who prefers formal outfits and everything, you're, you're kind of... Uh, it's, it's very difficult to decide, okay, I'm going to be getting a dress watch. Speaking of, but just in broader terms, talking about this piece, I think it is one of the most underrated pieces in the family. Talk about the complication. I mean, it's a world timer. Uh, it's got a beautiful power reserve on the, on the right-hand side. 
I love, I love it when a dress watch uses its dial to the fullest. Simple dress watches are nice, a basic dial, but I, I think the whole idea of a cluttered dress watch is so much more engaging for my tastes, at least. Um, and then we move further down. Oh, awesome. So now we have a Memovox from 2000. The Memovox is another brand. It's, it's kind of divided opinion between the Polaris and the Memovox. I'd like to talk about the brand a bit more and, and those two pieces in particular. I think I'd actually like to do a versus between the Memovox and the, uh, uh, the Polaris piece. I'm trying to catch up with the chats and see what else is going on here. Uh, why is JLC so undervalued? Yeah. Um, Chitown saying a Rolex date just is a perfect do everything dress watch. It is. And it's, there's a reason why the watch has become so important in our day to day life because not only its history, I mean, using the, the Oyster case, of course, we can, we can chalk it up to marketing. But uh, the idea of a rotating date window, I mean, how impactful was that to the world of watchmaking? And the size and the presence of the watch on the wrist, the jubilee for comfort. Um, I have a family friend who, who's owned a 36 mil date just since, uh, I'd say, the 1980s, in and around the time. And he's only ever worn that one watch. I mean, he says it keeps terrible time at this point. Like, it's, it's way, way slow. It loses, like, five minutes a week or something. So he needs to get it serviced. But it's just, it's crazy. It's a two-tone from, from that time period, and he still rocks it and loves it. So, yeah. And the Reverso, another, another watch that's, it's extremely loved, actually. It's one of JLC's huge sellers. And the reason why, I think, is because it's just so definitive. It's really, it's the watch that makes JLC known. It's the recognizable watch. I think recognition is, is important and partially the reason why we don't see some brands come to the front as much as we would like. Because you see someone wearing a GMT, you know it's a GMT. You see someone wearing a Speedmaster, you know it's an Omega. You see someone wearing a Reverso, you know it's a JLC Reverso. So it goes. Um, so let's have a good look at this guy, zoom right in. Interesting piece, and I, th I would imagine it's early 2000s, 96, this piece. Um, love, the, love the blend. And the whole idea of having two dials on the watch is just stunning, so it's great. I'm sure there are more reversos on this, no? Let's have a look. No, we're moving on. Now we're going to the 70s, and JLC in the 70s, uh, kind of hit or miss. I think they, they try to adopt all of those motifs that we kind of come to recognize. <laughs> and we watch guys says click on the reverso so we can see the standard dial yeah i'm afraid not it's a it's a pdf so <laughs> can't exactly rotate anything um Mouseman says there should be a wacky watches stream yeah i think i would be i would criticize them too much it would be a good idea though i think that would be a lot of fun i mean we could really just go insane and, and talk about the most peculiar pieces and just how they don't work or how they are exciting and different and interesting so these watches i'd say are kind of hit and miss but I love the Memovox uh, complication. I think it's it's a really interesting element. And then we move across, and what are these? More Memovoxes. They call this the parking alarm watch. How fantastic is that? That is brilliant. <laughs> well, I've learned this. This is something new. Uh, love the symmetry on the dial, first off. And the, and the actual, just the size and everything is great. But it's a, it's a parking meter. I mean, that's fantastic. I've never heard of something so cool before. Um, if you're someone who has to generally use a parking space often, or if you're a delivery guy or something, how cool is it that you have a, a parking Memovox? For those of you who don't know, a Memovox is basically just an inbuilt alarm. It's like a little buzzer that you have. So you set the crown, you wind it, and you set it to the certain position, and you'll be able to determine 30 minutes or an hour. And uh, <laughs> that's so cool. I really enjoy that idea. So there we go. We've got your first parking meter watch. And I'd imagine this is from the, the late 60s, 70s. Yeah, 60s era. Yeah, they did some weird stuff in the 60s and 70s. There were a few comments saying they agree. Bizarre. Okay, moving across, carrying on. Oh, wow. Here's an IWC. And the reference for this watch, just to catch up, is the 1969 reference 666A. Mm, lovely. And stainless steel engineer. Beautiful looking beads of rice bracelets. Oh, there's a few, I mean, there's a few elements that I want to address about just the way the dial has been arranged. Uh, it's mainly to do with the way the text has been integrated on the dial. Get to that now. Okay, there's a few comments mentioned me. Um, 
they did a boutique only edition of the Blue Dial Memo Vox as a reissue. Yeah, they did. And it's a cool looking piece. I think the size, the size is like 40 or 41 mils. And there's something about this, the slightly smaller size Memo Vox pieces that appeals to me. I think the whole idea of presence and proportion, especially with a watch like a Memo Vox that has that little complication, I think it's, it's quite nice and uh, unique when it's small. We watch guy again from James Stacy's of, James Stacy of Odinky has this great parking meter watch from the 70s. Crazy watch, but near mint, cheap, totally different. Yeah, James Stacy has good taste. He looks at some interesting pieces. Um, I've never heard of a parking meter watch before, so that was quite a nice find. Good to learn. So what I love about this, so the engineer in the 60s, um, I don't think that they hadn't exactly translated into the 70s era, so love the way that dial says engineer. And that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, the way they've done this, this layout here, so they hadn't translated the watch into the 70s to the more iconic, you know, integrated bracelet case and everything that we know. But I'm sure this piece had a Faraday cage around it to protect the movement. But look at the way that the engineer has been uh, incorporated in with a lightning bolt running through it. I mean, that is just so old school in the way it was thought through. <clears throat> and IWC really should go back to this beautiful uh, cursive font. I don't know what you would call this typeface, but that is just so classic. And uh, really completes it. It makes the watch, in a modern watch, this kind of typeface. I you can't really see it very well. I apologize. It's quite pixelated. But um, uh, a, a modern watch with this dial layout or this, this script would immediately call back to the idea that you're handling a watch that has a history. And I think many people don't really know too much about the brand that they're getting into. unless So you pick up an IWC and it has just IWC put on the watch. When you pick up a watch that has international watch company and it's all beautifully typed out like this, all of a sudden you say, hey, this watch has been around for a long time. This family has had a history, you know? That's just beautiful. That, that combination, you have the more modern engineer text and then you have this beautiful cursive font. Beads of rice bracelets, that's a stunning looking watch. Great piece. Oh yes, now we're getting to our field watches. IWC Mark 11, I hope. Yes, it is. Oh, this little guy is a gem. And uh, it's on, I would imagine, quite a traditional bracelet from the time. Ooh. So this is the, the real Mac Daddy of the field watch family. And uh, yeah, let me catch up with all of you guys here. I think no one's been mentioning me in the chat. They're just listening to me. That's great. I love that. So I can just focus on this. I mean, the, the history behind this watch, I really loved investigating the, the background of the, the IWC Mark 11. Get that IWC, Eric Bell says. Yeah, I mean, it is. What's amazing about it, I'll give you a brief, just a quick rundown of the piece. So in and around the, the 60s, they were chopping and changing ideas. And this whole, this watch established the field watch, you know. And they used the Flieger as the main inspiration. And they scaled it down. And I love the fact that this was the first watch to really push the boundary and get itself established. Yeah, we could say the Dirty Dozen established the field watch, but I think this pushed it into the next generation, you know? And uh, all of these little motifs, like the tritium at the quarters, uh, very sparse. The handset is very unique. It's a squared off element here and a, and a more jagged or pencil style here. White hand, it's basic, it's simple. It keeps lots of Flieger aesthetics. And as we know, these watches were now built to uh, MOD specification, Ministry of Defense. So these watches really did need to fulfill a criteria at the time. Beautiful watch. And I mean, they aren't, I mean, they're pretty hellishly expensive. This piece is from, oops, this piece is from 1951. Interesting. So we are not talking, that's quite amazing. I didn't know that they were around that early on. Yeah, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's so legible. Uh, great combination of elements. I wouldn't say, you know, it's it's polarizing though. It's not It's not just your simple everyday wearing field watch, but it is one of the pieces that really established the name. And then next door we have a JLC and this is from 48. So this is a dirty dozen. And this is one of the most desirable, oops. I hope the PDF doesn't do that white screen flicker as I go through. Um, if it does, I'll, I'll open it up again. So this JLC is one of the original dirty dozen pieces and yeah, it's just stunning. Very, very important. And I've, I've just noticed it has this transitional detail with regards to the way its hands are used. I mean, all of these companies were collaborating 
to, to create the same kind of watch. I don't know if this was built to Ministry of Defense specification, RAF pilot's watch, so it was. 1948, straight after the war. Dirty Dozen inspired. I mean, these are radium. These aren't tritium dials, so <laughs> you've got to be careful, you know. Uh, but it's just beautiful. I love, oh, geez. If I have to zoom out and the thing goes white every time, I'm going to have to try and refresh this because it really is irritating. You really have to give props to the field watch of that time period and just what it did. And then we get into these, I mean, these are all Dirty Dozen era or a little bit later, all incorporating similar aesthetics with broad arrow hands. Uh, we've got an Omega, what does it say? British military RAF pilot from 53 on the left. On the right, we have a Circa 1950s Air Force. I would say this watch is a little bit older. This could be something more in line with what we would see from, you know, end of the war kind of period. But uh, these really were the establishers. These are what made field watches so impactful. And then all of a sudden we jumped to Hoyer with a, with a flyback. And didn't, uh, didn't Revolution Watch have a partnership with a, with a model like this recently? I don't know if it was a Hoyer or if it was a Zinn or something, but they incorporated a very similar aesthetic with their piece. Uh, this is also an icon. I mean, it's amazing. The, the military-inspired pieces that we see nowadays, the history and uh, the development. Oh, my gosh. I really hope the flashing of the PDF isn't too bad. And check this out. Now we've got a Porsche 2000. Let's see. They call it an Ocean 2000. Okay. This watch is really interesting. I mean, it's, oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm going to stop this and try and get this PDF to work properly. Uh, we'll be on page 35. Apologies. Let me try and get it to stop flickering like that because it's so annoying. I really hope it doesn't do that all the time. This watch, the Ocean 2000, is just, I think it's one of the greatest industrial design pieces out there nowadays. Um, I, I love the not only the story and the development, but just the, the sheer sparsity. It's very 1970s, 1980s-esque, but uh, it's, you know, it gives you just what you need or just what you want, but some of the things that you need, it also doesn't have. So we look at the bezel. It doesn't have any plots. It doesn't have anything to tell you that you're using if it's five minutes or whatever else, which is a bit of a letdown. But I just love, I love watches when they have these racing-inspired dials, when the dials and the minute track match, sorry, say the loom plots and the minute tracks uh, line up and match well. Again, beautiful typeface on the dial. This watch did so well. I mean, really, as an industrial design guy who loves this stuff, I think this one really, I can see this on an industrial designer's wrist and just say, yeah, this guy knows his stuff, you know, this guy or girl, of course. Okay, let me see, there's there's a few, talking about mod improved, yeah, um, we watch guy, handset on that Porsche design reminds me of the docks a bit. It does, and I mean, it's it's just a direct transcendent of that period. I mean, the inspiration with the use of colors and the squared off plots and everything. And there was a mention, uh, Mr. C, currently own two Rolex, one Tutor and one Omega, but recently I have been attracted to Radot Quartz and Movado. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> Are we talking, is, is it Rado or is it actually, is it Radot? I don't, never heard of that before, but Movado, is that a bad thing? You know, Mr. C, we all, go, we all go through our ebbs and flows in this hobby, and I think you should just enjoy what you like. I think looking into, into brands is important. You get to learn a lot about what your taste is. That's what I've loved about running this channel is that I spend so much time writing about these things that I really learn about the details that I like, the details that I don't. I hope to bring that forward to all of you and share my opinions on various aspects. Um, but it's amazing how just creating a checklist on things that I like. So I look at this watch. This looks like such a utilitarian built piece for the military with the integrated bracelets, with the simple, beautiful bezel layout. Uh, the, the dial is just so crisp and easy to read, basic, you know? Uh, but the problems with it, of course, is that it doesn't have any elements on the bezel to help you with your dive time or any kind of countdown timing. So that's a huge negative. Love the idea that it has an offset crown and how the knurling on the crown matches the knurling on the bezel. You can tell that this, I think I made a video about this and I said, you can tell that this watch was made by a design house because they understand how these elements are, are relative to each other and there's a relationship between the parts. So this model is from 1980 with original IWC leather box, textile strap. I think it's beautiful. And we look at the case back. 
I don't know what Bunt is about, but it's quite cool. And this watch is made of titanium, if I remember. Yeah, I think it's just great. Very interesting watch. Um, not much more needed to be said. I made a video about it a few months ago. I recommend you have a look at it if you'd like to see more details. Um, I, I, I talked about Porsche design briefly and, and IWC, the Ocean Eleven in particular. And then we jump to more field watches. We have some Hamiltons. Uh, this is probably the original khaki before it was it was known as the khaki and uh, 1960s. So this is when Hamilton was introduced and they created some amazing stuff. Their movements were important. Uh, Shytown mentions, uh, am I crazy to see some dial resemblance to the 1655? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all in that same time period, you know. Uh, lots of companies were taking inspiration from that era and this is great. The one, the one element that I that I really like. Let me try and jump back to it without too much hassle. Ah, don't worry about it. Yeah, we we spoke about it long enough. So Hamilton, the original. I mean, this was like the original khaki, and uh, they did some great things. I'm sure we'll see some CWC pieces, but the movements in these watches were rock solid. They did a great job. And then you know the quartz crisis arrived, and Hamilton had to pull out, and CWC joined in. Uh, they incorporated their. Uh, they incorporated Hamilton movements in their watches for a while, but then they translated over to courts. It's a great history. I highly recommend you look at my military history. I really spent a lot of time <laughs> writing about all the different uh, backgrounds. It's great. I mean, when there's great archives to, to look up and condense into a, into a content, superb. So what do we have here? We have a Lemania from 75 on the left, and we have a Lema another Lemania from the 50s. Amazing how different they look. And this is stunning. I really like the idea of this case being integrated with its with its pushes and with its crown guards. Uh, more of a cushion case aesthetic, very comfortable. Um, love that balance on the dial. The use of numerals on this dial, very very World War II inspired, vintage esque. Pneumonia made some great watches for the military as well. Yeah, I think I also addressed uh, in in the French in the French uh, video that I'm working on French military. There's talk about Pneumonia. And of course, Longine and Breguet and Breitling and just nuts. So what we have here, we have a South, oh wow, South African Air Force, military Lemania from the 60s. Get out of town. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I am from South Africa originally, so uh, this is pretty cool. And there are some amazing, one cool story. Um, I will, I'll tell you as we get to it later on, we'll get to a Tudor just now. But uh, yeah, it's cool. I like these stories. As, as you might or might not know, South Africa is on the other end of the world. And the fact that you see Swiss watches being pushed out there, it's quite rare. And they are extremely rare for that reason. So as we get through to the more Tudor, I hope there is a, a Marine Nationale piece because I've got a funny story to tell you about South African Navy Tudor watches. Anyway, running through this, beautiful I uh, love the symmetry from the 1960s. So I would imagine this was probably during Angola. If you know anything about the Angolan war, not a very fun time. Oh, wow. There we go. So these are all, wow, all circa 1945. I love it when they do this. This is a lot. Oh, my goodness. This is one lot of, oh, wow. This is amazing. How's that? I don't know. This is not the full dirty dozen. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But this is a lot. And you have all of them. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This is a full set. That is, I, this is the first time I've seen this. Is this every brand? I don't see an Amiga. Yes, that is amazing. Wow. Okay. This is <laughs> how cool is that? This is a full set. Twelve dirty dozen watches on display. Look at the details. So, as far as I know, the most important watches in the family, Omega, very important. The most rare, I should say, Omega. IWC, JLC, look at that, it's got, a, it's got a cathedral hand, oh, it's beautiful. And then there was also, I think those are the three, and the Mania was quite big, Longines is also very popular. Oh, that is so cool. This is just amazing, guys. So there we go, you've got the full set, and some vary in rarity more than others. You know, the, the whole idea behind this was uh, during the Second World War, uh, the British Armed Forces needed watches, and oh, it's amazing seeing them all together. This this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of set you buy and you put in a display case and you mount it on your wall. It's just beautiful. Oh, it's great. That is really cool. And the going price between 25 and 30, I think it's well worth it for these pieces because as a full set, you can't get better. 
when you just think that they had a specification to work towards at that time. And each company did something slightly different with the handsets, with the dial and the numeral placement. Uh, generally, they had to have a sub-seconds dial there, and everyone had to have a broad arrow signifying its military intent. Ah, oh, beautiful. So cool. Never seen them in a set before. I've never seen them in, at auction as a set. You do see them online, but uh, that is superb. Eric Bell, I haven't said hi to you. Welcome. There's lots of you that I haven't said hi to. It's not because I'm, a, I'm avoiding you. Uh, I'm just running through all these pieces, and there's just so much on offer. Okay, next. We have 1945. Here's another Dirty Dozen, the MOD dial, another Lemania. Also, these are both circa 1945. And then we have the icon. The Little Smiths W10. Surprised I didn't mention W10 here. Dated 1970. And here's CWC, Cabot Watch Company, uh, which is also pretty cool. This was just as we transitioned over to courts in the 80s. Um, and before then, CWC was using the remaining Hamilton movements that were left behind once Hamilton left making uh, watches for the UK military. But the W10, I think, is just that field watch that really... Oh, it made such an impact, uh, in our hobby especially. Very important piece. Um, I love that this actually has a tropical dial, believe it or not. I uh, finished a write-up, and I've got the video prepared for the Smith's Everest. That's all done. I hope to have that out maybe Thursday next week, I'm thinking. But, uh, yeah, it's just superb. I, I do a brief history of Smith's and talk about just how this watch pretty much um, – this was, this was made in Smith's heyday during their time. You know, just after the Everest uh, summit and all of that history, and oh, it's great. So we've had a good look at field watches. I hope you enjoyed that. The the real winner for me. This is amazing. There was a mention, uh, Bud Owen saying, "I take that over a platinum Daytona." I mean, that is so cool. That is such history. Think about this for a second. Every single one of these watches was worn by a soldier on the front line, whether in Europe, in Africa, uh, maybe even in Asia at the time whether they were in the Navy. I think this was issued to Army only, so only the ground forces wore these. But uh, 12 different guys wore this watch over time, and they all have their own story. They've all been used like to their, to their fullest. You can see they've got scratches and dings. and I mean, that's just you know kind of tear-jerking. And you consider that all of the men who owned these watches are probably on their deathbeds right now as well. It's like it's such a great capture of history, you know? Junior Johnson, welcome. Yes, doing well. I hope you're all well as well. Um, it's been a crazy few days, but uh, all I can say is don't watch the news. Try and avoid it as much as possible. Do the right thing. Think, think that you have it, and think of, the, think of your neighbor more than anyone else. I think that's very important um, because it's not so much worrying about your health. It's worrying about getting it out and spreading it to other people. I think that's especially those who have compromised immune systems. They're going to feel the whack of this badly. And I come from a family who has a background, or my dad has a background, very compromised immune system. So enough about that. <laughs> Fauna Times Capital, fashionably late. Oh, fantastic. Welcome, James. We've had a great time. We've looked at field watches. We've just been browsing through. We've just had a look. Check this out. Just, this is just for James, Fauna Times Capital. We're looking at uh, Watches of Knightsbridge, and this is a full set, all 12 of the Dirty Dozen on offer uh, as a set, as a family. How often do you see all 12 together in superb condition? I'm just thinking to myself, hey, this is just such a win. Okay, we've chatted about them long enough. We're looking at CWC. This is when they picked up after Hamilton left, and they started doing a few quirky things. When we move over to Omega, we will start seeing the, the beautiful dials that Omega made back in the day. Um, Okay, extremely humbling, as Mark P says, 12 guys, at least 12 people wore those watches. It's amazing, right? It really does, kind of gives you chills when you think about it. 1983, I mean, Quartz, CWC, you can still buy these today, and you can buy them brand new, which is pretty cool. Oh, and here we go. Speak of the devil. So this is a Seamaster 300, and I love these papers. This is from the archives. Military Diver from 1968, and... Uh, I love the history of this watch. So this piece came in before the Rolex mill sub. These, these watches you can still get for pretty reasonable prices nowadays. And I find it amazing when I did the history discussion of this watch, how they used a professional case. I mean, this is quite literally a Speedmaster professional case that they incorporated with this model. 
big broad triangle on the dial, lovely balance, sword hands. This is the way a dive watch should look, you know, aggressive, just, just nuts, uh, fully loomed bezel, Bakelite, I would imagine. I'd be surprised. I mean, why would they be using Bakelite so far into that time? Seamaster 300, I just love, and I love the historic references in the family. Oh, it's just cool. So between 15 and 20, they're expecting. I've actually worn one of these. I think I have. I've worn this one of these exact watches uh, at the same at the same shop when I was trying on all the vintage Speedmasters. This thing wears very big. Talk about presence, you know, that on a wrong 18 millimeter Phoenix. Is it, it is an 18, you're right. And I can see by the weave, very good eye. Who was that from? That was from Eric. I can see by the weave that it's a Phoenix. Um, what I kind of hate is when they, they put a modern uh, a modern Phoenix strap on this watch. I think there's something about the uh, the original straps that you want to keep with the piece. California says that uh, those, those Lear lugs are timeless. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it, Amiga really has made it their own at, uh, at this point in time. And I just think it's crazy. The thing that blew my mind was that before this time, they were still working on we think of watches like the 57 Seamaster and, and that kind of case styling, very slim and sleek. And then they were told, okay, we need to increase the presence. We need to make this thing big and large. And they just said, hey, let's just put a professional case in, 40, 42 mils and just rock it. And they made a monster, beautiful watch. And the beauty comes from its, its functionality, the, the visual weight of all the elements on the dial. What I find crazy, and this is something that you might find interesting about military-inspired watches, we often see these fully graduated bezel inserts. And the reason why they did that, especially for the Rolex Mill Sub and, and this watch, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Mill Sub came after this, but the idea here was you can't exactly read the minute marks on the dial. So to supplement that, they made them much bolder on the bezel so that you could read them easier. It's a little bit of an unknown thing. I read it somewhere. Because you can't read the numerals on the dial well enough, the numerals on the bezel are accentuated so that you could read the minutes pretty easily. Anyway, and there's mention about the 2254. I mean, that really is a callback. It might be one on the, on the auction list. I don't know. Oh, it's just beautiful. Uh, we've been going now for 81 minutes. What's that? An hour and a half. We're doing well. Beautiful piece. I mean, moving across now. Oh, yes. So now we get to a 1963... Oh, CK2998. Whew, now we get to the good stuff. I really, really like Vintage Omega. There's something about their watches that are just stunning. So it's a 321. Looks like it's in pretty stellar condition, right? And the patina on the dial, the handset. I mean, this is first Omega in space, no? This is the same, the same dial layout. This is pre-professional case styling it's all straight up down lugs nice and easy the alpha yeah, alpha alpha styled hands oh it's just a gem and i love that they, they incorporate the the paperwork behind it so you get to see mm. this i mean this watch is one example that shows you and this was an interesting extract from archives to the british military suppliers the navy army and air force institutes so this was actually a service watch well it's right here genius didn't even read that uh this watch really defined its life at this point when it came through. Uh, the 57 model didn't have so much of a splash. We know that history. We know that the 57 uh, Speedmaster and the Daytonas, they were all competing for the racing watch scene. And then they decided to pretty much put Rodania and the Geometer out of business, use their same dial manufacturer and create the watch that we know. If you're, if you're on Google now, look up Rodania, I don't know how to spell it, Rodania Geometer, and you'll have a laugh. I think Bazamu or Bazamu, he, he runs a great page. He discusses the watch in detail. Um, anyway, so there's someone saying, I was born in 63, Mr. C. Well, hey, if you've got, um, what is that, 15 to 20 grand to spare, <laughs> uh, this could be yours. Oh, it's just beautiful. Just, I think it's one of those really important pieces of the time. And then we move through. This is a 1960, delivered to Australia, another 321. This watch has seen the wars. This is exactly the same reference, C C29, CK2998. Uh, but this one has been used a little bit more harshly. And I would imagine that uh, the tropicalization we see on the dial is just purely because of the Australian sun, you know? Um, if you're from that part of the world, you know just how, 
how heavy sun can be on, on paint. Uh, Chaitan saying, sounds like a lot of those Swiss watch companies plucked from common parts bins. That's the story, as, as far as I know. I mean, I'm by no means a historic expert in any of this stuff, but uh, it's crazy just how things were chopped and changed and borrowed, especially when you look at the, the military watches. Uh, there was no real rhyme or reason. It was just what worked, use it. A beautiful piece. It looks like it's been scratched up like crazy, looking at the bezel and everything else. Moving to the next, what else do we have? Okay. Now we've got the professionals arriving. Uh, here's a 1967. This is a pre-moon that looks beaten the living daylights. It's, I'll pull right in so we can have a good look. We all like our Speedmasters. So the professional case did a few great things. I think one, I wouldn't say, it's not so much about the presence that's important about the case, for me at least. I think what made this watch so good when we look at it more aesthetically is that the, the whole idea of this integration where the pusher and the crown is recessed into the case so there's no real area for knocking and damaging. This, this whole format was important for that reason. I don't know so much about the jump to 42 millimeters if that was very necessary. Um, speaking of which, these watches were put on spacesuits and everything else. So uh, yeah, but this looks like quite the mess. You can see all the loom has disappeared off the hands. Were they using tritium at this time, not radium? They were using tritium. This looks like it's aged. I think it's been in a tropical environment most of its life. Next door, we have a 67 pre-moon. And this looks like it's in much better shape, just comparing the two side by side. And let's look at the price differences. They expect, they expect the one on the right to go, oh, hold on, moon landing tribute case back accompanied by Omega. That's weird. Okay. So I don't understand that altogether, but uh, interesting blend. And the prices of these watches differ quite greatly. Uh, I don't know. This, this should have a 321 as well. No? No idea. Moving on. Now we get to a bit more modern. Now we have a 71 on the left and a 1997 on the right. <laughs> it's funny to see that the, the 71 is in better condition than the, the, the 1997, like a 20 year difference. That's crazy. Um, uh, but they're just, they really are important watches in the family. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna catch up with you guys. I hope I haven't missed too much. It's great that you guys are, are debating and discussing amongst yourselves. Speedmaster number one recommend watch. Yeah, it is. I mean, the it is a watch to really get into the hobby. It's that's that enthusiast watch. Um, maybe it's overhyped at this point. Maybe it's pushed too much. Um, it's it's sad when a watch gets to that level where it's almost unimaginative that you just say, okay, I get a Submariner, Explorer, then a Speedmaster. But it's a watch that really has a great history. It's an, it's an historic reference. Uh, made a great impact. It's, it's an icon. I mean, it's one of those design icons of the time. And this is, a, this is a Speedy Tuesday. Now, this is what I don't really understand. Let's have a look at this. What does it say? Dated 2017, limited edition of 2012 pieces. I don't understand any of this uh, story behind the tribute to the Alaska project. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand any of these tribute watches. I'm so behind on the times. I don't know if this has to do with uh, social media related stuff or just because it's a reverse panda dial. You might want to fill me in on those details, but interesting looking combination. I like the bracelet. Do like that whole, uh, it's nice seeing that the bracelet actually has some articulation to it, you know? Omega age really well. This is from founder. Some amazing tropical dials. Yeah, I agree. Superb. There's a new movie about radium gold. Is that so, Austin? I, Tom Austin, I need to have a look at it. It's a crazy story. The radium girls, wow. Uh, they, they all were, in the factories working on watches and, and clocks. That's fantastic. I actually want to bookmark this. Let me just, I'm going to open up a tab and make sure I capture it. Awesome. Thank you for that, Tom. It's an amazing history. It was really the first sign uh, in our history when radium affected people. And they did a lot of studies on these girls who painted clock faces, toothbrushes. I mean, radium was used everywhere. It was this, it was like the it was the asbestos of the 50s. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the results, the, the jaws and everything you, you saw. If you don't know what radium girls are, just look it up in Wikipedia and you'll hear the story. What do I think of the JB Champion from Chai Town? Mesh bracelets, I think, are very effective. And I don't think any of these watches have one, sadly. But it's the, the problem is 
It's difficult to say because aesthetically, it doesn't exactly work with the watch. It's undersized. It fits kind of peculiar. It looks very peculiar. But oh no, don't twitch on me, please. PDF. I don't know why it does that half the time. Um, but just in general, a mesh bracelet really is a, a symbol of its time, of that a time period, you know. Um, it would be nice to see, of course, hindsight, looking back, it would have been nice to have seen those bracelets actually take the full width of the watch. Some people say it's very tacky on their pieces, um, but some also just like the idea that astronauts wore them and it's a unique look. It brings down the visual presence of the watch. Okay, going through. And Thomas, I don't even think I've said hi. Thomas Burnett, it's great having you here, brother. I hope you're doing well. So I don't know anything about the tributes to the Alaska project. Uh, very peculiar, but you live and learn. I think the real Alaska project models are a bit more interesting when we look at them historically, you know. Oh, far out. Now we've got some Amigas from the 70s. <laughs> we've got chrono quartz, uh, LCD screens and all of that. I don't know uh, if this interests you at all. But Amiga did create one of the best quartz movements back then. They did an insane uh, job. If you watch Talking Watches with Roger Smith, he talks about the piece and it just chows battery life, but it is such an effective timekeeper. Very peculiar. I've never, I can't say I've ever seen, a, this is actually a Speedmaster on the left-hand side. Speedmaster Quartz LCD, very peculiar. I do like the Jubilee bracelets and the turn in, oh, the lugs, it looks gorgeous, but I mean, it's LCD and you're like, oh, well, a bit strange. Anyway, going through, I've got some more Amiga Seamasters, Flat Jedi, they call this with a cushion case. Uh, love it. Just the, the 70s, like I said in the beginning of the show, the 70s inspired watches were just so all over the place. Design of watches back then, there was just no clear idea. Oh, wow. This is a DeVille from 1969. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, I have to do this. I have to close the page again because it's doing this flashing thing. I don't know why it's doing it. Page 47, let's get back to it. I have no idea why the PDF just decides, okay, now I'm going to glitch out on you. This is an Omega DeVille, and I would imagine this, this probably would have a 3 2 one movement from the same time, you know? Uh, oh, it's beautiful. The DeVille is another. It's, it's like the, the Carrera of its era. You know, so many people had the DeVille because of what it was as this dress sports piece. And I love the blue on the dial, the strap the combination. 1969, brushed blue tachymeter dial. Probably quite rare nowadays. And the condition is also superb so really nice to see okay going through i have no idea why this thing's flicking i think maybe the the computer's hot or something and it's struggling a bit so on the left we have a 1967 seamaster chrono and on the right we have a 72 seamaster wow they were doing all sorts of things back in the day again the time period they just didn't know what was cracking this looks like a, wow it's amazing this is called a deep blue oh Sorry, you're gonna to have to put up with the screen doing its white flashing. No idea why it's doing that. Anyway, this looks like it's taking direct inspiration from the likes of the Doxa that we saw earlier and the, uh, the Seamaster 300. Crazy, right? Never seen this piece before. And it looks pretty small in stature and presence. I would imagine this is about 38 mils for the rest. Crazy combination. Uh, and the Flightmaster, it's another watch that I need to discuss. This was quite the, the aviation aeronautical piece of the time. Oh, I really wish the PDF wouldn't do its, its glitching out moment. Seamaster 60, big crown from 76. Uh, this, this is crazy. I mean, the sizes of these watches, I'm pretty sure they were smaller than your 36 mil. Um, interesting use of colors and the burgundy blend. But again, talking about 70s references, you either love them or hate them. And then we jump to a Ploprof. I mean, these were your original Ploprof watches. And I really don't know the development and the story behind this, but I would love to look into it a bit more. This was a, one of those Jacques Cousteau watches, again, uh, similar to the Doxa Sub. It really got its placing in that time period. And uh, Thomas Burnett has a baby Ploprof. These are just nuts. Uh, talking about design and everything else, I wouldn't say they are the best designed watches in the world. They looked like they were just punched out of a CNC or a milling machine. <laughs> There's no real thought put into them. But what I do like is the way that the crown system operates and how it, it locks into the case. And uh, 
Yeah, it's great. Okay, let's see what's going on here. I want to catch up with all of you. There's a few questions addressed to me. If that first Seamaster Chrono, as Roger Smith has, looks like the video I recommended. Yeah, interesting. We watch guy. Um, and from Reed, a birth year watch would be a great question to ask the audience. Mark P, that can be that can be the subject, not next week, but the following week. That'll be great. Your favorite birth year watch or something. <laughs> Proclof is Gordy. I think Dean, that's quite an understatement, you know. <laughs> And Space Age, Thomas Burnett says, yeah, I, I don't know what they were thinking. I mean, maybe there wasn't much thinking. Uh, the whole the whole functionality, the idea behind the, the bezel ratchet and that you had to actually have a hand free to push the button and use the bezel. I think this was at a time when they were still trying to develop the ratcheting bezel. And I'm going to address that in the, the P01 video that's coming out next week, I hope. Uh, the whole function of a ratcheting bezel we take for granted nowadays, but back then they still had friction fit bezels, you know? So it's it's strange how these prototypes, I would call this watch a prototype. I wouldn't call this a fully fledged product. It's quite a novelty in that. I mean, the, the handset and the, the dial layout is just beautiful though. The watch is so legible. You can see it so easily. Stunning. Great combination. I think it's cool. There was a mention about PDF readers that I want to get to. Uh, probably way up in the chat that I've missed. But it's horrible when it's temperamental and I'm trying to like run a show as slow as you know methodically as possible and then there's a glitch out. <clears throat> anyway, on the left we have a Speedmaster from 2000 and on the right we have a Constellation. Is this a Globemaster? No. Uh, interesting. I mean, this watch, you can find these all over eBay nowadays. These Constellations are everywhere. And uh, hit or miss. I think the pie pan is beautiful. I think the Globemaster is a watch I need to look at as well and just discuss how well it sits in its family and what it means when we look at its um, its past and also just how of much of a horological improvement it is compared to its standard meta swatches that are made nowadays. Um, Constellation on their case backs. Yeah, we watch guy. They, they have this big meteorology uh, medallion at the back basically signifying and this little star is important as well if i'm not mistaken this little star on the dial indicates that it's a piece that uh passed severe testing and is a cut above the rest in its line might be wrong there but um i need to look at the globe master there's been suggestions on it in the past and i need to discuss it more because there's lots to look at uh gorgeous looking watches though it's nice seeing a bit of history a bit of modern a bit of vintage and now we're going to some more pieces. This is from 1939. Very interesting, kind of sector dial-esque. And this is the original Marine. Fantastic. From 1938, the Omega Marine. So before we had the Seamaster and all the other diving watches of the time, this was, this was made to be the first waterproof watch, one of the first. And uh, it's amazing to think this was issued to militaries and it had basically two cases, one case that slotted into another that was all self-contained. And you could essentially take this into the water and, and be fine. This is basically one of your first fully waterproof watches of its time period. I don't know the depth rating and the history uh, without the outer case, Eric Bell says. Is that so? So the, so the Marine, the Omega Marine, I highly recommend you have a look at that history because it's quite something to pay attention to. And then we move further down. I'm trying to avoid the screen glitch as much as possible for you guys. Um, we have a Longines. I'm not going to try and pronounce that word. From 1945 with a salmon dial, luminous markers. It's kind of like your pre-California dial with the way it's arranged. Very military-esque inspired. And uh, crazy how the case is eerily reminiscent of the Dirty Dozen watches from that time period. Crazy, right? Oops. Oh, no. Oh, no. No magic mouse, don't do this to me. What did I do? And then we have a Longines right here with a sector dial. Is this a sector? No, it's not. It's a Longines from the 40s. I don't know how it is a sector dial, technically. Uh, also, a really interesting case, very field watch inspired. And then we move across to Jean. <laughs> I don't know how this just came out of nowhere, but this is a reference. It's an Octo Divine automatic move and phase calendar power reserve from 2004. Guys, I'm sorry about the screen doing its flashing thing. I really don't know why it does it, but Jean in general, I am actually planning on doing a discussion around the resonance, which is the watch that uses two movements identically and synchronizes itself. It's amazing. And uh, I hope to discuss it in more detail and 
highlight a few elements that maybe haven't been spoken about enough. But Jean, as a watchmaker, has done some incredible things. I love the language that he uses with these watches, uh, modern, retro, clashing those two ideas together. But then at the same time, it's a watch that is his own brand at this point, just the, the typeface that he uses, just the way you look at the dial and the, the relationship of all the numerals on the dial, the offset subdial. Um, asymmetry is one of his biggest talking points, you know? Great. It's nice seeing a bit of modern, and I think we're going to be transitioning now. Okay, we've got to offer a case back. This is a 1989 Patek reference, 3960G. God, I really, I'm going to try it once again to close this PDF and see if I can get it right because it's very annoying. I really hope you guys aren't epileptic or anything else because this could be a bit of an issue. I think it may just be the, the computer's very hot and it's not keeping up with me. So, I mean, what can you say about this watch? We've got Breguet-inspired nuances everywhere. And there was another watch. I chatted about a reference. I think it's called the 59, the 5059 or the five, no, yeah, the 5059, I think it's called. And very similar elements on its dial. So not only is it an officer case back, but it has your straight up, down, very traditional pocket watch lugs uh, screwed in, make it very traditional looking with the Breguet numerals, Breguet hands. It just, it just screamed Breguet actually. And there's talk about how these watches sort of, you could say, do they not steal from Breguet in a way? Are they, are they, you know, paying homage to Breguet? Are they stealing their, their motifs? Hard to tell, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And this one's engraved sadly. So you could probably polish that out, but I think this whole format of a Patek that uses Breguet elements, it's very interesting. Nice combination. Very officery, as Rich Buddy says. Great to have you, Rich. Nice to have you on the show. Welcome. Uh, we're just slowly but surely running through all of these. We've got a Quartz Calatrava. We have a Patek. This looks like, very, I mean, from the 80s, both from the 80s on left and right with hobnail bezels. And we have a Ladies Nautilus, which you don't seldom see. They're quite nice, actually. Very and it's very understated in a way, not very gaudy. I can imagine the size of these pieces are quite bearable, you know. Um, Patek has bought their license to borrow, as Shai Town says. That's funny. Uh, some more ladies' pieces we can sort of flick through these. I don't know if any of you are interested in ladies' watches, but there's a few up. Oh, and this is one of the watches on the cover of the screen. So, this is a 2012 deep sea tribute to 1939, and it was developed for the American market. Oh, God, I'm so irritated by the flashing screen. Okay, so puts me off my train of thought when I'm thinking about what I'm trying to say. Um, if you don't follow Craft and Tailored, I recommend you check out their show because I'm pretty sure Cam did a discussion around the deep sea alarm, and I think it was a European dial, and the way you can tell is, is the placement of the, the typeface on the dial itself. Deep sea alarm, just like a memo box, really. Um, just it's water rated, so you can actually take it into the ocean. But it's beautiful, right? And as as Rich Buddy says, it's slick looking. Uh, and on the bunt strap, I don't think you you see this watch on a bunt strap often, so that's a nice combination. Oh, another detail to highlight is that it's oh my gosh, every time I zoom in, it does this. Um, another detail to highlight is that it's made by the Bamford Watch Company. Well, well no, not it's marked by the Bamford Watch Company. So I would imagine, what did they do to it? Did they PVD coat it? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they just put their seal on it to give it some kind of clout, I don't know. But uh, regardless, scratch out the Bamford, it's a very cool watch. Just talking about the the balance on the dial. Again, we're talking if we talk about the, the Porsche 2000 Ocean Porsche design piece, I, I love the way that they do the batons and the, the whole idea of everything being balanced on the dial. Easy to read, symmetrical, well spaced and proportioned. Yeah, I'm afraid this PDF reader is going to be messing us around a little bit. Maybe if I leave it here at the semi full screen, you might be able to see it okay without it glitching too much. Note the Bamford, so it's messed with somehow. <laughs> yeah, we watch guy. I think it must have had some PVD coating or something. So this is a Bamford Daytona. I don't know what they did. 2016, it's a 116520. That's very peculiar. Again, sorry for the for the white screen flash. So they kind of inversed the dial in a few places. They this doesn't look like a ceramic bezel insert. It looks like they PVD'd the bezel. Oh geez. So they PVD coated the, the bezel insert and PVD'd the the pushes and the crown. 
that is that is that's not very good <laughs> i really don't like that at all um uh, yeah shame i mean and this was the time when there were ceramic daytonas out there so uh, yeah uh, i I've, i've mentioned my my pet peeves about pvd coating let's see what the next watch is okay now we get to proper rolex cool so the idea with pvd that i don't like we were just talking about watches in general i think when you're speaking more of an industrial design language um you need to celebrate the material that your object is made from i think that's very important so whether it's made of ceramic whether it's made of tin copper uh, steel gold it's nice to actually use that metal on the surface and uh when you pvd coat something it kind of lessens that whole idea of celebrating the material that it's made from you know um anyway it's yeah pvd coating i i really i think i should do a video talking about pet peeves and pvd coating again everyone sorry about the flashing screen i really don't know why it's doing it but uh, i hope hope you can take it okay and then this this milgas another one bamford watch there was a mention in the chat a second ago 1655 now we get proper rolex <laughs> but owens yeah that was that was the first watch i actually looked at when i got to the page it's pretty cool So again another watch PVD coated from Bamford I think someone mentioned it a second ago uh and something yeah from from we watch guy and we've got our typical little explorer um I kind of like this this color scheme for the Milgaus because the Milgaus is all about radiation and and uh you know infection and all of that so that green kind of makes it lively you know um and the little explorer i mean this is a 114270 by the end links and all those details everyone's telling me i should get an explorer and i'm kind of on the fence <laughs> um again the flickering screen and then we get to our uh, pucker explorer 2 explorers 1655 circa 1970s well, that's very specific thanks guys <laughs> um let's just sorry catching up If you want a custom Rolex check out Mad Paris. Thank you Founder Time is Capital. Be good to have a look at. Um speaking of celebration material, what do you think of DeLorean? Uh DeLorean made their cars out of carbon fiber? No. I I don't know the story. Uh was it carbon fiber? Was it was it graphite? It wasn't titanium? Was it well, aluminum? Was it a full aluminum body? I can't remember the story exactly. Um I'm not that well versed in my 80s nostalgia. <laughs> But uh Look when you're moving it when you're moving a, a brand forward when you're moving a technology forward the use of carbon fiber and all of those elements it's great I think it's cool it's just when you when you coat something with another material I think that's when you kind of lose its its effect fiberglass with brushed stainless over the top geez how interesting yeah I need to look into the DeLorean I've discussed it I've discussed it before I think it was designed by um Jajaro Jajaro who did the, the Mark 1 Golf and the um the Countach Anyway, world's slowest sports car. The 80s was a weird time, right? So looking at these two pieces, it's very interesting seeing that juxtaposition between the two. It's actually great seeing the the sheer divide between the 70s and the 90s and just how the Polar Explorer came to be and how the 1655 remains as this icon. I don't call it the Steve McQueen watch. No one should call it the Steve McQueen, but in a way um it has that rakish quality about it that i guess transcends the idea that it's a watch that he wore and i think in that context if you substantiate your answer by saying that you call it the steve mcqueen watch because of it being quite rakish and out there and uh, cool then that's great but when you say that he wore it then yeah of course we know the story but look at that combination those those two divides there's so many elements about the 1655 that i like uh just talking about the dial and the placement the use of the uh, the broad arrow hand that's what made the watch what it is and uh how they then translated over to just a a typical GMT dial you know i don't want to sound like a grinch but i think some of the magic was kind of lost with the explorer 2 once it transitioned over to the more generic simple rounded plots the GMT hand. The nice thing is is that the watch isn't exactly recognizable in this condition. You you can't tell that it's a GMT unless you you know a thing or two about the watches, but just seeing these two side by side, you can just tell how how different they were. And of course, we know that the 1655 wasn't a popular seller, so 
Yeah, it's a great little bit of history and it's one of the biggest outliers in the Rolex family for sure. It just doesn't correspond at all with what the first Explorer was about. And uh, it really has a space all to itself. <laughs> and uh, founder Thomas Capital says, love the 1655 of the day I die. Yeah, it's what I find bizarre is that it's just not spoken about anywhere near as much as watches like Daytona's and everything else. But I really think it deserves a limelight for, for what it, it did and how it pushed the brand. Yeah, it's a, it's a capture of its time. Oh, here we go. Another one. 72, straight hand. So this is a Mark I, and it has a integrated bracelet, integrated end link. I love these photos. This is why I love looking at these catalogs, because we get to see the watch in all the right light. Okay. Getting to the chats, and I'm seeing there's a huge debate going on here talking about uh, DeLoreans and carbon fiber. Uh, geez, DeLorean made a chassis out of fiberglass stainless. So I think that's what I was thinking about in something. Uh, fiberglass chassis was what was on my mind. Hitting the coffee, getting back into it. This is a great condition explorer too. Love the, just, yeah. And another thing, the inter integrated bracelet also, the whole, um, the whole integrated end link with these models just sings to me. I think it was quite a shame when they got rid of the idea of an end link that ends uh, right on the lugs itself. It looks more intact, you know, compact. It's superb. And Rich Brady says, isn't this the Steve McQueen? <laughs> I don't know if that's a bit of sarcasm. I don't know. Yeah, one of those cult watches. And then we jump across to an Explorer 2. And I never get, I never get this reference right. It's a 16550. I, I didn't actually know this until further investigation that the... Uh, the 16570 came after this. And before that, this was the transitional model. And it's basically just adding, it was one of the first Explorer 2s in this modern configuration with cream dial, of course we know. This one's been beaten. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have any uh, paint on the bezel. And it's a different bezel set as well. There's a bit of a more modern approach to the bezel itself. But the cream dial, I mean, this is what everyone aspires to own in the Explorer 2 category, especially when you're looking at polo watches. Final Times Capital says this watch is worn by Gordon Ramsay. He has some good taste with his watches. I've seen him wear a few interesting uh, vintage subs in some of his shows. I've never seen him wear one of these, though. Crazy. I mean, the dial looks kind of toxic. <laughs> you know, it looks kind of infected when you, when you have a close look at it. Um, but as we know, the tropical polar dial is something... And this was also a tritium dial model of the time. So these loom plots would also age. So it's, it's one of the most desirable Explorer 2s next to models like the 1655 and all the rest. Yeah, it's cool. Looks old. Yeah, it does, Dean. I agree. Oh, 1970, 6262 on a Jubilee. And uh, yeah, I mean, this, this period, this whole post, this is a post-Newman dial right? I'm so useless with my Daytona references. Um, but uh, the, the Jubilee is something quite unique with this reference and this family. It'd be nice to see more Daytonas on Jubilees. Um, we were talking about the Hoya Carrera earlier and just how similar the dials look. I mean, these look like they've just been transplanted, you know? And what's the price this is going for, by the way? Between thirty and 40000 I mean, it's just nuts. Like, uh, I'm, I'm personally not someone who, who really loves the Daytona. It's not a watch that speaks to me the most in the Rolex family. So I would never be someone to really appreciate this watch. I've handled a few vintage, uh, what is it, post-Newman post, post -Newman Daytonas. I haven't handled any, any Newman Daytonas of the time. I think I've handled a few 6263s, but that's about it. Um, and I just, the size is amazing. I must say it's like 37 mils and it's, it's beautiful but it's just not a watch that really screams to me in the Rolex family. Of course, these are just, they're, they're loved by the community. It's, it's a cult watch at this point, but uh, yeah. That Daytona is what dreams are made of. I think it's what's nice about this, especially with the champagne dial, is how it blends with the stainless steel. Uh, it's vibrant, but also very casual and understated. Um, I'm pretty sure these models also came with aluminum bezels at the time. And they call it the big eye. There's so many little aspects like Daytona written in red and uh, being an underline. This is pre-Oyster, of course. Doesn't have uh, push, pushes that are screwed down. So circa 1970, they say. Very interesting, though. I love the combination. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, 
stunning piece really stands out well <laughs> that pick must be five years old at 30 to 40 as rich buddy says yeah it looks like they kind of underplayed the price but auction houses generally do they always offer it for a slightly lower than they expect it to go for and uh, then they they grind it out as the auction goes for those of you who've just caught the show um this auction will be going up saturday next week if you're interested in any of these uh, i'm just browsing through the catalog because it's just great content it just gives me stuff to talk about and uh, this is called a blackout explorer if i'm not wrong and dated 1991 and the, the real element that made it the blackout were these these numerals that have been uh, blacked out on the dial what's the price they want for it between eight and ten thousand this kind of falls in line with models like the commando and the family the 550 it's it's a very unique watch and many people love it it's in the explorer line especially in this category uh they are very sought after again apologies for the glitching screen um it's just stunning it really is nice something about the uh the numerals i kind of wish that the numerals were loomed I think the watch loses a little bit when the numerals aren't new, blah, 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 when the numerals aren't loomed fully. You know, uh, it loses a bit of that symmetry. But in saying that, the the whole idea I don't know the story at all about this. I'd actually like to learn the history, but why they decided to black out the um, the numerals at all, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone if anyone knows. Um, from we watch guy despite the short hands i like the 21470 mark one oh for the black up interesting so he's he's referring to the the first gen the mark one 39 mil model that has all sorts of peculiarities like full white gold numerals and you get that blackout effect like he says because in certain lights those numerals disappear uh, interesting but of all the explorers i think the commando is the one that everyone lusts for because there's so few of them in the world but personally, I love loomed numerals on the Explorer. I think it just completes it so much more. Uh, again, I'll say I've got a Smith's Everest video coming out, the, the one that many have been asking for, and it's nice. I, I do a nice little historical discussion and then go into my wearing experience and how the watch, the design of the watch, not so much the watch itself, but the design and just the simplicity of it, how it's impacted me as a daily wearer. Uh, interesting that it's from Hong Kong, as Rich says. Great eye, Rich. Um, I haven't even been looking at that. <laughs> it's great. You guys in the background can see all these little details. So this is from paperwork from 2010, original case back sticker, still applied. Great condition as well. Just looking at the, the lugs and everything else. Cool looking piece. And then we go through, oh, geez. So this was also on the cover photo. This is a 1988 1016 R serial going between nine and 11,000. Peculiar how low price they, they're asking. Actually, that's fairly reasonable for a watch like this, no? Uh, let's try and get this better. The 1016, I'd actually like to know, what about the Space Dweller? Brute Williams Watches says, yes, absolutely. The Space Dweller and the Commando share a similar kind of landing. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great little story about the whole Cosmograph and the Space Dweller. They were so gunning for, for space. Never really happened that well, but... Um, I would like to know, okay, let's do a little community. If everyone is in the chat, let's do a little community, yes or no. Comment Y if you like the 1016, comment N if you don't. I would love to see the divide of the, the 80 of you who are watching. I would love to know what you think about this watch because it is divided. Um, I think it's very Rolex in the way it's done. But then also there are a few elements like the Mercedes hand that could have possibly been improved on with a pencil hand instead, you know? Um, it is, I would say, of all the Rolex watches in their line, it's probably the least polarizing, you know? Uh, okay, so let's see. We've got a couple, lots of yeses. One no. That's great. Thanks, Dean. Uh, another no. Two no's. Wow, well, lots of yeses. It's, it's amazing. Uh, and that's the question. Do you think it's because of good design? Do you think it's because of its simplicity? Um, it's kind of multi-layered. Uh, the presence, I think, is what works so well for me, for my tastes. I like the idea, and I'll actually just say it now, in the in the Smiths video, when I talk about the design styling and all of those details, that's what the yeses have it, you know, and Dean says it's too small, okay. Um, the element that I, I like to capture when I talk about this watch a lot is that with the little Smiths Everest that I wear often, it's a watch I wear when I don't want to think about wearing a watch. And that never happens to me normally. You can never really put on a watch and not pay attention to it. But with this 
simple layout. It's basic enough, but complex enough that you can appreciate it for both of those reasons. And I, I think I repeat this a, a few times in the write-up. I say the beauty about simplicity is that you get just, um, just the right amount, uh, not too much, not too little, but enough to appreciate what you have been given. It's kind of a bit wishy-washy, but <laughs> you get the idea, you know? Uh, simplicity, typography of the numerals. The typography is what does it for me the most, I think, compared to all the other watches. I mean, the 214270, beautiful, great size, great presence, but the numerals on this watch does it for me more. Is it sad to say that the only thing that's really divided me from picking up a 214270 is the styling of the numerals on the watch, you know? It's like, that's when you really become a stickler or just, uh, you know, when you really get into the hobby hard. I don't like the numerals on the watch, therefore I'm not getting it. It's not that it's just a great everyday wearing watch. It's just, ah, you know, funny. Final time is capital. Positively towards the end of the year, the great escape meet. Been warned my wife wants to take part. She is a success in my life. That'll be awesome. Definitely married up. <laughs> that's from Mark. Okay. Um, Okay, awesome. So this is good. Nice looking at the 1016 or a design guy. Yeah. Uh, for your PDF woes, try to use Acronaut Reader instead of Apple Reader. Thank you, Mouse Man. Yeah, I must say that the pre preview, whatever this is, it's just not doing it today. I'm surprised because normally Apple stuff works pretty well. Um, so again, if you guys do suffer from epilepsy or anything else, I really apologize if these flashes are annoying you. Um, okay, so we've got a 550 on the left. Here's an example from 1967, so this is one of your pre, your early explorers, and then on the right we have a 1969 Prince, this is a Ranger. Now look at that for a, for a split between the two. I'm gonna zoom in closer, expect the flashing screen. <laughs> um, I think Cam from Craft and Tailored just did a video on the Ranger, his own personal watch, and I highly recommend you check it out because the Ranger is, is quite a unique piece, and look at the divide between the numeral placement and the typeface used, similar, but not exactly the same. The scale is ever so slightly, you know? Uh, let's catch up here. Ninebolt says, don't forget the buyer's premium on these prices, 24%. Almost most of non-Rolex watches sell at a low grade. If they don't make a low grade, they are withdrawn. Rolex tends to go higher. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, if you are buying a watch for the this idea of value retention, then I think a brand like Rolex is great. Uh, I, I really don't appreciate markups. I mean, some markups are just stupid. I've really been looking into all sorts of watches recently. Like, I, I'm not, not kidding. Uh, since, I would say, November last year, I've been browsing. And the markups on Rolex watches, it's, it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> when you see uh, what you can get for less money. You get more watch for less money. And just as well made, just as uh, well detailed. It's all, again, it's all down to the dial and the brand itself. You know, you're paying for the brand at the end of the day. And it's that point when you juggle, am I spending this money to buy the brand or am I spending it to buy something of real quality? And there is a cutoff point. It's like a, it's like a parabola. You, know? you get to your peak and you say, okay, these watches are all even in quality when we look at their movements and all of that. But... Uh, you're just paying a little bit more for the Levi's jeans or for the, the Sebago Dock Siders, you know, <laughs> so whatever. And there was a mention here about um, why can't Tudor go back to those classic hands, Okuzen? There's all sorts of things. I mean, Tudor is really trying to play into their own little market segment with the way they're designing their things. I actually, I, I address it in the P01 discussion, looking at uh, just how the watches have developed and all of that. So it should be good. But it would be so nice if Tudor had to re-release the Ranger just like this, even with a Cyclops. I mean, what the hell? Um, the Ranger and the North Flag, those watches need to be pushed out more in their line. Just imagine if Tudor had to bring out like a great little 36 mil, just like this, same typeface, same layout. It would be a, it would be a smash hit. Talking about the, the, the Tudor sub, and something says, if you can ignore the hype, you get three to four times more watch for the money. Unfortunately, 80% of people in the hobby only understand hype. And that's it in something. I mean, you're a man who has uh, JLC, uh, Zenith, and Moser, I think. Those are your brands. And I feel that same way. I really do. Because the watch that I am going to unveil when I get it, I've, I've kind of narrowed down the, the spectrum now. Hope to highlight it and give you a good reveal in the next few weeks. Um, I wanted to not only be a watch that 
hits every mark for me. But at the same time, it needs to be a watch that epitomizes what I try to do on the channel, what I try to talk about. Wouldn't it be amazing that I get a watch that becomes like a quote unquote ID guy watch that is then um, also it summarizes all the elements that I love and talk about often. Um, so it's, it's going to be cool. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> hope you enjoy the reveal. I'm going to do a few more discussions around other subjects in and around buying a new watch. It, it was the feedback was great on part one, by the way. For all of you who commented, geez, it was amazing. I loved reading your stories and everything. Um, Rob Smith, I hope I get a two two five four. Well, we will have to wait and see. I definitely don't want to un reveal it yet, but it's going to be a goodie, and I think you will. Uh, if you haven't bought anything yet, stay patient. Market will go down. It's gone from watch guy. Yeah, I agree. There's all sorts of discussions around that at the moment. But uh, I've heard some interesting news. My family is in the medical field. And I've heard some interesting news out of Bayer and Sanofi that there is an anti-malaria pill that is being used and being treated or being used on patients. And it's had a 100% success rate. So... It's pretty bizarre. We can get into that. If you'd like to know, just um, just comment, ID guy, elaborate. <laughs> I can give you more details about that. But um, check how gorgeous this little Oyster Prince is. 1966 uh, with a 24-hour dial layout. Love the, love the red highlights. I mean, this is just a basic, simple watch, you know? Um, superb. But Owen's saying that story is going around right now. Um, I don't know if you're talking about the... the uh, Hydro, yeah, that's it. Hydrochloroquine. Thank you, Mr. Perpetual. That's it. So you'd like to know, well, you know, I'm by no means an expert in this field at all. I can say my old man has been in pharmaceuticals for uh, 40, 50 years at this point. Um, lots of doctors, he knows. And um, it's amazing, the development there. I mean, they've been, of course, these pharmaceutical companies have been testing all sorts of things. Look at this Tudor. We were talking about the Monte Carlo earlier. This is probably the best we'll get. I don't know if this is a Monte Carlo, is it? Big block. Uh, Tudor Oyster date. So as far as I know, oof, apologies for the glitch. As far as I know, this simple anti-malaria medication, it's a pill that you can get over the counter if you're living in a place like Africa, um, is very good. And it's been used, I don't know the, the clinical trials, but they've been, it's been used on many patients. I heard a stat, something like 300,000 people have been, um, have been treated with it, and they've had a 100% success rate. Now, the thing is, of course, now we've got this huge media story going on and people of power in control with all of this. You, you don't know whether or not that kind of news is just going to be suppressed. You know, um, Get my old man on the show. Ryan, he doesn't know much about watches, so it'd be quite embarrassing. But uh, <laughs> um, and so that's as far as I know. And it really gave me quite an quite a uplifting bit of hope because, geez, I've been taking all the measures. I'm sure most of you might know, my, my father especially, he is seriously immunocompromised. And uh, we have to go around with masks and gloves everywhere. There's no, no point in, in bothering uh, trying to avoid this. If you, know, if you can avoid it, I recommend you do. And uh, hearing that little bit of news is important at this stage. If this can be pushed out further, they're, they're saying that the bonus is, actually look it up, Sanofi, S-A-N-O-F-I. COVID and it should come up. Um, the thing is, this whole idea of a treatment based on just an mala anti-malaria tablet compared to a vaccination, which will only, vaccinations, let's be real, will only arrive in 2021 if we're lucky. But if uh, this happens and this works out well, that a simple anti-malaria pill works, companies like Bayer and, and Sanofi, I know are the two that make it, uh, it could be fixed within a few months if it's done correctly. And, you know, there's a bit of a wake-up call. <laughs> See, Eric, well, does he have a proper old roadie accent? No, Eric, he doesn't. Uh, my dad was, he was in Zim until the 70s and then moving to South Africa. We all have more South African accents. Vitamins A, D, C, boost your immunity, Ocazin. Yeah, and it's crazy. I mean, the panic buying that's going on is just freaking ridiculous. I tell you, they're getting all the wrong stuff. <laughs> they're buying all the wrong stuff. And the vitamins, the vitamin shelves are still full. Anyway, getting back to these watches, I, I didn't want to talk too much about the bug, but uh, you know, it's kind of impossible to avoid. So this piece, 1993, reverse panda dial. These these Tudor pieces are either hit or miss. 
love it or hate it. I do like the fact that it has that D Daytona case and uh, thick lugs and it, it mirrors the styling, but they go their own way with the, the, the sub dials and all of that placement. Never understood why they would have a oyster, excuse me, a Cyclops lens on the crystal itself. There was a mention earlier, I think I saw from Reed saying, uh, from Tritown saying, let's take a second to thank all the doctors and scientists working. Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's amazing. I, what I would like to do is to thank those who work in places like supermarkets and convenience stores and, and all of those places because, geez, uh, it's, it's insane. Just a post office, for example. You're dealing with so many people coming in and out, and um, it's amazing. I mean, those people who are able to do all of this and look after themselves and perform a service, they are the real heroes. I would just say the people, the simple people who are uh, working in shops at this point in time, uh, it's so important to thank. I think especially if you go into a shopping mall, say, tomorrow, you should thank every single one of those people who are working on the shelves, who are getting stock, who are trying to accommodate for this stupid mad rush that is going on for food i mean it's just i mean toilet paper i mean for god's sake what is wrong with you <laughs> you know you just don't need to do it and uh yeah real heroes if trucks don't roll we all starve and that's it i mean all of those people in the, in those industries um yeah anyway moving on so this is just beautiful as rich buddy i think says this is a monte carlo and it is simply awesome it is the it's real it's the real watch of the 70s i mean this lines up exactly with the the monaco of the time but has managed to transition that period so much better i didn't even check the date 1976 this watch has really been able to transition a little bit smoother uh love the idea of a cyclops on the the crystal at the base i think that's so quirky and peculiar um love the orange highlights and the accents and the racing dial Oh, they did some great stuff with this watch. Uh, of course, it's not everyone's alley. It's not uh, It's not everyone's cup of tea, but I think it does look the business. And it's we're talking about watches that almost define an era and catch people's attention. This kind of watch you can wear, and someone would say, nice Monte Carlo, you know? Uh, you don't have to necessarily be a watch guy to know what this piece is. Uh, you kind of, if, if you know anything about watches, I'm sure the Tudor Monte Carlo is one that really stands out always 10 10 as ryan says you're talking about those 10 out of 10 yeah i think it's cool very unique watch and uh special oh okay this is what i wanted to talk about actually these snowflakes i know we speak about them often divided opinion about the snowflake hands and everything this model is from 77 it's a 9411 because it has a date complication and a cyclops i want to catch up with you in the chat and tell you an interesting story uh, earlier, there was talk about a Lemania from South Africa, South African military issue Lemania. Let me try and get that scroll bar out the way. Sorry, everyone. Let me just catch up with the chat and see what else is going on here. It's cool. It's kind of slowed down, so I can. Awesome. So I was uh, browsing around vintage shops in London and came across a store, and there was this beautiful, what I thought was an a Tudor Marine National, blue dial, blue, uh, blue bezel on a phoenix nato strap went in asked to have a look at it and it is technically this is mentioned about in something snowflake snowflake hands dial way to do it yeah i agree i think if you have a snowflake hand you need a snowflake dial because those parts i mean it doesn't take a, a, a brain surgeon to see that there is a correspondence between the elements on the dial when you have squares on squares you know everything is sharp and jagged very nice line in something. So I went in and checked out this beautiful little snowflake. And he says, uh, it is one of seven known South African Navy issued subs. Um, as far as we know, the history goes is that the South African Navy, uh, they I don't know if they had Rolex mill subs at the time. Remember, this is 70s era. But there were only seven, between seven and nine of these models issued to the Navy in South Africa during the 70s. Don't know the story, but they are some of the rarest in the world. And it's, it's nuts, right? Um, so that was quite cool. Being a South African going into the store in London and saying, hey, this comes from uh, the land I'm from back in the day. It's amazing. Uh, and this, I, th I think the, the styling of this watch, it's as unique as models like the Submariner. I so wish the Tudor would just wake up and bring a Tudor Submariner to market just like this. Can you imagine the impact? 
uh, the ace, it's an ace up their sleeve. And uh, would I consider it you to snowflake? Shaitan says, you know, when I think about a one watch, this watch is too polarizing for me. The squared plots, the squared numerals, I think it's a bit too, uh, too much for me for an everyday wearer. I need something simpler. Um, but as a package, there's, there's such a nice balance of complexity and simplicity there, you know. Um, I love the, love the tan, the beautiful fading. I don't know if these look, these might be replacement hands for all I know. But this model is just so correct with the integrated bracelets and end link. And the styling of the cases back then, you know, this was a 5513 case they probably used. That's just a gem. Between four and 6,000, they expect this to go for. That is kind of an, under, an undercut for price. And then we jump to more. Okay, awesome. Jeez, how many, what page are we on? 68 of 100. You're kidding me. <laughs> that is insane. What other watches do they have on offer? I thought we'd just run through everything at this point. That's nuts. So this is a 1992. I'm going to try and motor through here. How long have we been going for? Two hours and, what, 15 minutes. It's pretty good. So uh, 1992. Let me just catch up with your chat one more time and carry on going. There was a mention of Bafana Bafana. That's very funny. That's the South African football team, if you don't know. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ryan. Okay. Um, the number of confirmed cases in the USA has doubled. Yeah, Rich Buddy, it is nuts. And uh, I really just think <clears throat> everyone should go two more hours, baby. <laughs> Rich Buddy, <laughs> oh, you're a legend. Rich, I love watching your shows when I get a chance. Um, I, th I think at this point, it's so important that we all not think about ourselves so much as our neighbor. And that you should, I mean, I'm, I'm masking up, not just for myself, but for everyone around me. People scoff and stare at me and, and comment. I mean, I got a stupid comment one day saying, it's not all that bad, you know. And I said, well, you know, there's, there's elderly people here who could get it and really be in serious problems. I'm not thinking about it for myself so much as everyone else. And if everyone had that same mentality with gloves and masks, it's just one of those things. I think it would help improve the case a lot, help improve everyone. But, you know, this utopian idea, of course, it would never work in the world when we, when we see how people are buying from shops and all that rubbish. Okay, just catching up with everything else. Um, we watch guy. There's a great chat going on. Sorry, if you guys don't tag me in the chat, I kind of miss things and, and the page scrolls all over the show. Um, let's see. Interesting. P01. The P01 is going to be a cool discussion, Thomas and founder. You guys are chatting about it. Um, I am going to be quite ruthless and brutal, but also very fair and talk about just why uh, the watch is important in its line and what it kind of means for the development of the brand. And we watch guys says, that's what I tell my parents. I tell them to think of other people that they're putting in. And I think it's important. I know it's, I know it's difficult to, in a situation like this, most of us, I mean, you think of 80% of the population who will get this technically, as they say, we will get very minor symptoms. But um, for, for those of us who, who might get an extreme case, who might need to be hospitalized, et cetera, uh, you know, why take the risk? You could easily just, you could help improve your chances by, by lessening that. Social distancing, I think, is, is important as well. Anyway, uh, there was a mention, uh, when will they see my, uh, from Andreas, will we ever see your face? Yeah, absolutely. I would actually, I had an idea that if I ever reach something like 100,000, by the time I reach something like 100,000 subscribers and the channel really takes off, I will be able to afford proper camera equipment and get it all set up and try and, you know, have a studio. It would be superb. I mean, if I could run a show from a separate studio office and have a film crew and everything and really get it going, not only have me on the screen, but have the watches in hand and everything else, that would be superb. I think subscribers means quite a lot in this day and age, as much as I would like to not like to admit it. Um, I really... I never like asking people to subscribe to the channel. I think that's kind of disingenuous. Um, but one of these days, I think if I ever reach something like a big milestone, like 100,000 subs or something, then maybe we could do like a full-on face reveal, do, do the whole nine yards, and it could be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, you know, that's wishful thinking. What I'm, I'm not even, I'm nowhere close to that at this point. Um, I'm more interested. The thing is about what I like about doing it this way is that being anonymous you are not looked at as a persona so much. You're looked at for the content more than anything else. And I like to focus purely on the content. 
it also saves me a lot of time. I don't have to worry about what my hair looks like and what I'm wearing and the lighting and all that rubbish. Just focusing on the work, I think, is more beneficial because there are more than enough personas and people on this platform, you know? Um, the watches are the stars. I try and bring them, as, as Shaitan says. They, they are the things I try to bring to the forefront and talk about. I'd much rather have interesting commentary around the watches than having a look at my stupid face. <laughs> anyway, let's carry on with these. Uh, these two tutors. I was I was mentioning all of that rubbish, Lawrence. Yeah, I don't even know what I said. Um, I was thinking about the Tudor Submariner and if they ever had to reintroduce the watch back in the day, in the future, sorry. I think this format would be something that makes it stand out from its Rolex sibling. And uh, I th I, it's, it's unique. It's, it's very characteristic of the Tudor brand. I uh, love the balance on the dial. Don't know so much about the Mercedes hands. You know, anyway, Thomas Burnett, thank you so much. Here's to 100,000 subscribers. Yeah, I mean, in a million years, let's be real. Uh, no, it's the thing. When, you, when you're opinionated about a subject, this is definitely a niche channel talking about uh, the watch design. I mean, most people just want to see the watches in hand and everything, but whatever. Um, and this is cool. This 68 reference, I would say this is a Vietnam era reference. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's on its original riveted bracelets. These are amazing. And I love the story. If you don't know the story behind Tudor watches that were actually issued to the military forces, yes, and they were plexi. They were all plexiglass from Reed. <clears throat> I wouldn't say that. I'm sure the 92 would also be plexi, yes. Um, the amazing thing about Tudor watches as, as dive watches for the military back in the day was where Rolex and the mill sub, they had to do all kinds of things to make it look beefier and fatten up the lugs, make a bigger knurling on the bezel. Tudor literally took their watches off the shelf and sent them. Uh, and they were just ETA powered movements. Um, even the Tudor MNs weren't modified in any way. They were just packaged and sold to the military. And that is something quite, uh, quite a novelty, pretty impressive, considering that they held up so well. And even now, we look at them on the screen, they're still doing just as well. Kind of gives you a bit of a reality check when you think about how people baby their watches, not, not wanting them to get damaged and everything else. But these things have pretty much seen war zones. I'm pretty sure these have been military issued over time. And they're still holding up today. Steel is an amazing substance, you know. So Andreas says, uh, I think I'd love what such progress to 100K with good camera gear face reveal would do to the channel. I'm sure it would. I'm sure if, if my face was, you know, on the screen all the time and people got to relate to me more, uh, the, the following would be much bigger. I'm pretty sure that would be the case. That's generally what happens. But in saying that, I'm not that interested in that whole idea. Personally, I would much rather have the, the write-ups. I always wanted to make this channel about write-ups and discussions around watch design instead of me. I don't, I don't want to be the, the focal point so much, you know? Um, so catching up, and I think I see from Mark. Mark's off. It's been a great fun. Apparently, I have chores tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Mark, take care of yourself. I really hope you're doing well. And I got an email from you, but there's like a trillion others. Anyway. Uh, let's see from Chaitan. Watches are tougher than ever. They're people, and, and that's the thing. I mean, modern watches today, the technology that's gone into them, they are the most rugged things imaginable. Uh, over this course of time, they are the best they've ever been. And people baby, baby them the most they have ever been babied before. It's amazing, right? Anyway, so, uh, 1968, 7016. I mean, that's just a beaut. And this is a 64, 7928. Um, Beautiful looking pieces and and the cell the smiley self winding little little detail of script on the dial I think that all played to the watch's aesthetic back in the day and uh, yeah it's great I cannot believe we're only on page sixty eight how is that even remotely possible sixty nine of a hundred I just don't know um, normally the show should be about two and a half hours so I think I might motor through these I don't want to hold you guys back it's already half past twelve in the UK. Mark, thank you so much. If you're still there, thank you so much for the super chat, Mark. Really appreciate it, brother. And uh, I really hope you're all taking care of yourselves. Anyway, from Sandard saying, military watches are truly a touchy subject to me. I never truly know the line between admiration and capitalization. Very well said. I never want to spend money on instruments used for war by soldiers. Hell, that's a very well, and I mean, think about, think about just fashion in general and vehicles. There is an argument to be made though that the military implementation of these objects has helped, uh, you know, 
make our civilian life improved over time. We know that, just think of the First World War. Before the First World War, uh, before the end of it, I should say, we had guys on horses killing each other. <laughs> By the end, we had uh, tanks, we had airplanes, zeppelins, we had uh, geez, air submarines, we had naval ships, we had uh, cannons, artillery fire. There were so many changes just in that short little stint. The way I try to sum it up is that desperation calls for the most innovation in life, in the world we live in today. I think that could be the the main theme of the show. Desperation is where the inspiration really comes from. When we are complacent, that's when nothing really happens. But when there is a need for something, a plan will be made. And we could take that into what we're experiencing now in the world. There has to be a plan made or else it's going to be a disaster. Nowhere near as bad as bird flu of 1918, but still bad, you know, impactful. So in saying that, that whole idea of capitalization of military implementation, geez, I'm really on a roll tonight. What was in my coffee? Um, you can see it both ways. I mean, we wouldn't have cruise lining ships like we have today if it wasn't for that time. The Cartier tank, the development of the sport, there's all sorts of little things. Uh, it's like hindsight. But then when you have a watch that's been used in the field of combat, then maybe, then maybe it gets a little bit more touchy, I would agree. Interesting point, though. I mean, that could be its, a subject to itself, you know. Um, anyway, military watch honors the original owner. Yeah, I would say so, too. Okay, so talking about the, the details on this, I mean, this has been worn for sure. 1966 tropical uh, military Rolex Tudor prints, Israeli Defense Force. Interesting, very interesting. So this was used. Uh, interesting case, squared off lugs. Looks like it's been beaten. And as you know, the tritium degradation and, and water damage and everything causes all sorts. Check this out. I saw this earlier and thought it would be awesome. So this is a beautiful tropical dial. Uh, rare gentleman, la, 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 uh, oyster prints. So nothing special about it. It's just just crazy combination of elements. Love the browns on browns. Um, yeah, too old for two wheels. Uh, very good point. War is a common technology accelerator. And that's always been the case. You know, it's, it's a joke. War and peace, truth fears. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. The times of desperation cause, calls for inspiration and for innovation in many fields. And I think we're going to see that sooner than we would like, or well, sooner, no, sooner than we would have expected in this case. James, founder time is capital. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, I really hope you're well, James. I can't wait to be able to travel. I mean, just when I get everything in order for me to travel over to Paris, now this happens. It's just nuts. <laughs> and Reed, thank you. Well, I mean, I talked about military watches for a second there and, and all of that. Anyway, thank you. Uh, let's see what a new Bond watch. Is that the new Bond watch from Bud Owens? That's funny. That is so funny. Um, okay. Tropicalization on dials. You're paying for age. You're paying for damage. <laughs> and uh, this brown effect, you know, it's, it's crazy just how these watches have been marked up so much for their damage. I mean, that's the debate in itself. What do you think? You can consider these watches piece uniques because of just the way they've aged. And if I'm not wrong, Tudor watches, since they didn't use as effective methods of application, they, um, they aged a lot more than the Rolex counterparts. I don't know if these watches were used more actively by more active people, but you, you see Tudor watches tend to have tropical dials and fading a lot more commonly compared to their Rolex counterparts. Of course, there are lots of Rolex watches that have tropicalization. So this is a 61 PCG. I don't know what that means, but it's just great seeing the brown on brown. Again, apologies for the screen glitching out. It's very annoying. But look at those details. The, the knurling on the bezel is sharp. The case is still sharp. It's actually got an eagle beak crown system. So this is, this is a real precursor. It's quite a transitional piece. Um, I'm catching up with everyone else here. Trop uh, chocolate goodness from Aquazen. Tropi Dial Speedmasters. Uh, we chatted, we had a look at them earlier, Rich. If you jump back maybe an hour or so, uh, there were some beautiful pre-moon Speedmasters out there. Um, got the email to pick up the new Bond watches, founder. Yeah, that, I chatted about Bond watches in the beginning of the show. It was part of the Live 5 and had a good look at the watch itself. There's a great review done by Views from Mark. Look it up on look up his name on on YouTube. He does an unboxing. Um, and Chai Tan says, does the 1999 Corolla with peeling paint count as patina? Oh, absolutely, sure does. 
No, I mean, it's unreal how the whole Wabi Sabi thing has been translated into watches and you're just paying for damage and wear. I mean, I personally wouldn't buy a 356 Porsche if it wasn't mint or a, or a 56 Beetle, for example, if it wasn't in mint condition. Uh, you know, you don't want to buy a car with a completely rusted through chassis. So, you know, it's all of those things. Oh, wow. This is amazing. What is this? This is a 16. This is a 1665. This is a sea dweller. They call this the great. Wow. Fantastic. This is a great white. And look how that bezel has gone blue. So the great white was quite important. Um, the real transitional 1665. This was in the same time period when they had the red text. This was the elements just the watch that came out just afterwards if i'm not wrong uh oh it's stunning really is nice and these vintage sea dwellers they are have they have to be some of the most interesting watches in the in the dive watch sphere the the patent pending helium release valves and all those crazy little things um same as a relic strat as eric bell says yeah absolutely absolutely uh I would never go out and buy a relic or, or, or Levi's jeans that have been ripped up or clothing in general. I mean, you can do that yourself. <laughs> you know, why pay for damage? It's just nuts. Oh, it's just the stunning, really nice looking piece. Interesting that the bezel has gone a blue color and they say rail dial. Uh, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit wishful thinking. Wouldn't you say? I'm pretty sure all the 1675s from this time period had a similar, similar aesthetic, similar dial. Isn't patina just affect time and environment have had to the watch? Yeah, Andreas, that is that is the argument. You know, it's it's that idea that the watch has been through its life and that it's experienced all of these things. And people like that, that it has a bit of a story and the narrative behind where it was worn. And all of that makes that and think that what's important is that that whole effect gives the watch that peace, unique feeling, you know. Um, and something said, I once went to see a Porsche 914 buy as a project car car had been repainted using paint roller and paint brushes <laughs> that is incredible now that is just depressing i mean geez that is just useless how and i mean you can you can it sticks out like a sore thumb when you see a bad refinish on anything if you know what you're looking for it's just it's laughable anyway beautiful watch i love this uh i'm sure many people would agree it's it's a stunning piece it really was a trend setter for the sea dweller oh yes so these are when we get to the actual heavy hitting watches, a good two and a half hours into the show. Uh, there's just a few more pages, so I'll kind of blitz through them. 1680 from 1974, apologies for the screen glitching. Uh, beautiful brown strap, and then you look at the bezel, it's gone a burgundy color. That, that patina on the dial is so even. Yeah, I'm kind of on the fence with the whole patina effect on the dials, you know, it's like, it's like the watch isn't even effective anymore. It doesn't glow in the dark, it just looks pretty. Uh, it's funny. Uh, let's see what there's a mention about Craft and Tailored has a super supernova dialed OP. Crazy looking buttons. I actually handled. There was a super lumen, super. What do they call it? Supernova dialed um, GMT, who was bought by a very interesting individual. Uh, he'll he'll remain nameless, but I met him, and uh, I had good hands on time with the watch in London. And it's just it's amazing. You've never seen a dial so ridiculous in your life. This. Uh, sunburst effect but then you also have these white specklings all over it and it just it's crazy piece unique i mean it really is one of barely any that has that kind of finish it's a full i think it was a 16 i don't know what they call a solid anyway it was, it was a beautiful gmt 1675 era uh, solid gold um that's not patina on that porsche <laughs> as found as i'm capital says that's funny and this is a feed first very well spotted and that was from eric that's great um it's, it's a gorgeous watch. I think I, I love the red. It'd be so nice to see the sub receiver red uh, highlight of text on its dial again. Maybe we will see it in the coming months, uh, depending on how this release story goes. I know there's lots of debate about release dates and everything now. It's kind of a pity that everything's just delayed and laid back now. Anyway, that's how it goes. Perfect imperfection for that sea dweller. Nice definition of Wabi Sabi. It's interesting, right? Um, but you know, it's it's all up to interpretation whether or not you like the vintage effect, whether you think it kind of overkills it or not. Great looking piece though. And there's just, it's amazing. We've got a 5513 here. This one looks like it's seen a bit more wear and use over time. <laughs> I mean, this is when I draw the line, okay? Um, when you have a watch listed for sale, I don't know if you can see this, but on this end link, I'm gonna zoom in. I hope this screen doesn't glitch too badly. Uh, I mean, how much time 
I change the straps on my watches practically daily. You know, I'm, it's like a second nature thing for me with a spring bar tool. How, how fast would it be for you to just pop out the spring bar, get a little bit of a rag, not a, not a, polishing, cloth, not a polishing cloth or anything, just a, just a rag to clean the schmutz off the end link. I mean, is it that difficult to do? <laughs> I think that's when it gets a little bit too far when the watch is quite literally full of all the dirt and grime. Ugh. <laughs> you know, if you had to put this watch under in a sink and fill the basin, uh, I think you would have like a kilogram of grime left in the in the basin afterwards, you know. And there's talk about perfect imperfection and the whole idea. Yeah, it's it's cool. Uh looking at the hands, I, I don't know if these are originals or if these are replacements, or well, this is a replacement dial, that's more likely. Interesting that the bezel has a uh, a khaki color scheme to it. I don't know if that's the lighting or not. Uh, let's have a look. And the price between 10 and 12,000. This is a 1970 5513 feet first non serif. Interesting. Very interesting. Moving through, and we've got more pieces. Oh my goodness, guys, this has been this has been a long show. We might even hit the three hour mark at this rate. I think I'll call it at three hours because this is a little long and uh, there was a mention about the geophysic. Do you think it's possible to negotiate the price on a geophysic? I think it is, Andreas. Um, a few people have actually shown me that they've been looking at one. And at this point in time, absolutely. I would say, uh, it might be an unpopular opinion, but I would say buy your watches now. That's that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm spacing it out and waiting for the opportunity to buy a good watch because prices are dipping. If you can get 30% off retail, jump on it, man. That's... That's what I think. Uh, anyway, carrying on. So we have some yellow golds. I mean, we've seen these watches to death at this point. We've got an original Batman uh, BLNR between nine and 10,000. This watch would go for the, the, the craziness that's now being directed towards these watches with the, the oyster bracelets is something fierce. And then next door, we have a 1998 solid yellow gold. Swiss only dial, which is quite unique. And then we keep scrolling down and we have our 1675s. I haven't seen any of these on the show lately, so that's quite something. Um, I, I think the original 1675, the Pepsi, is just some, such a gem. Um, one of the first I ever tried was a near mint 1675 on a Jubilee, just like this. And it was just, it's, it's an amazing experience. It feels so unlike your modern Rolexes that you try today. Um, and, and not at all chintzy or like, you know, lightweight or anything. It's very comfortable. And the case and the proportions and everything is just ever so slightly different in a few areas, you know? So that's cool. Nice observation on these pieces. And then we scroll out to the next. Oh, here we go. Here's a good example. Uh, this is a 1972 for the Mark I Long E matte dial, uh, far out. So what they're referring to, I'd imagine, is the Rolex symbol with the Long E. Interesting. Okay, screen glitch. Apologies there. So this long E reference here. I mean, I mean, where do these guys get all these details? I learn something new about details every day. So that E is slightly stretched on the Rolex name, and that gives it the the credentials of being called a long E, sixteen seventy five. But look at the condition of that. Interesting. Look how they've done the bezel. I mean, if you if you didn't know any better, you would imagine someone just took some sandpaper and gave it a bit of a bit of a polish, you know. <laughs> uh, amazing. I, mean, I love this 1972. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks, founder. Uh, fat Lady, is that what they call it as well? The, the Sophia Loren? I don't know if that's the model. I think the Fat Lady was a, a 16750, if I'm not wrong. There's just so many, yeah, so many watches within the, the mine. Uh, ben Space Vulture, hope you're okay. Do we see another stream with user watches? Yes, we do. Ben, every every second week, I'm going to be running Wrist Shot Week. This week is more of a topical discussion, and what we're doing is just basically browsing through a catalog, chatting about design. It's been quite a historical discussion today. And uh, I highly recommend you catch up if you haven't missed it, because we've gone through a timeline of watches and their designs. But come next week, we will have. I will ask for submissions on Monday or Tuesday next week, and we can make wrist shot week happen again next week, Saturday, which would be great. Um, we watch guy, exactly. I mean, the differences are cool to note, but not sure I'd consider it wearing it daily. And that's the thing. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a nuisance that these are so expensive nowadays to buy and own that you just don't want to wear them because you could damage them. And 
you know, it's all up to interpretation. If you know how to look after your stuff, I think you'll be fine. I mean, the the, the GMT that I wore, the 1675, I uh, bet that bezel, oof. <laughs> yeah, it's a love it or hate it thing. It looks like someone just took some sandpaper and gave it a bit of a, a windscreen wiper effect, you know. Um, the 1675 that I wore was mint. It, it was brand new and it had a, a pretty cool history. I don't know if it's sold just yet, but it's, it's pretty rare. It's a special owner, I should say. Uh, quite a historical figure gave the watch to a president. Um, okay, so going through this, this is a... 1963 6430 with an Arabic dial. Can't say we ever see it either before. I'd like to know your thoughts, if anyone's still in the chat, of the, the 62 of you who are watching now. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on this, the, the font on these dials. I don't get it much. I think the whole uh, the layout, I don't know. Of course, being built for the, the Arabian market, that's something. But for the European side, I don't know if there's much appeal. Uh, it's unique, it's collectible, but is it something very uh, enticing? But Owen says, not a fan. Shaitan says, I love that Arabic dial. Uh, comment why or no. Do you, why or N, sorry. And then something says, everyone is on self, is in self isolation. Next week, everyone should post a pic of a dress watch for the suit jacket, quarantine in style. <laughs> That's funny. You know, we could do something. Maybe we could have a theme, but I think the variety is better. Um, I think the variety of sports and dress together in a, in a submission set is more entertaining because everything's different. I mean, I don't know what comes up next, you know? So let's see. Uh, yes, there's lots of love. Uh, no. It's bloody two in the morning in Denmark. Sorry, Andreas. Yeah, this has been going on for a while. <laughs> um, interesting. So there seems to be quite a quite a pull. True Arabic numerals. Absolutely, Eric. And we call the standard numerals that we see Arabics, but these are the actual Arabic numerals. Um, I do not know the history of these numerals at all. Uh, it's definitely a novelty. It's and, and I guess that's what they're banking on with a watch like this. It's it's unique because of its dial layout and all of those details. And I would imagine this is the same case styling as the, the sixteen, what the five five zero zero Explorer, or the uh, the ten sixteen or the ten nineteen. I'm sure they all rank in that same kind of area. Moving through, and now I think we're kind of ending off with the Oyster Perpetuals, so we can slowly but surely filter through these and the Oyster dates and everything else. Uh, we've had our peak at this point, I would say. We're getting we're slowly but surely winding down. It's pretty good. I, I love the, the directive. Um, okay, slowly but surely going through these now. Um, so this is an Oyster Precision. Beautiful alpha hands and, and bracelets. It's amazing seeing how well intact these bracelets are over the time. And we've got an Air King. I mean, Air King is an unloved watch which is very sad because of just how important it is you know it's a very commemorative watch in the really they are hindu arabic oh wow nine bolts thank you for that um yeah so i mean the air king in general is it's an important watch given to raf pilots and its history is something to take note of but now it's just been turned into this strange reference where rolex is just dumping their parts as as they move on with their explorer you know uh, there's talk about the Air King being discontinued. I think it was discontinued. I don't know the story. And we've got a few date just with linen dials and all of those details, nice and clean. Two tones. I think I, I really enjoy Romans. Roman numerals on date just does it for me, uh, and especially on, on day dates as well. Tetley is joining. Welcome. <laughs> and we've been going for like three hours at this point. A little bit, we're a little bit behind. And we're sort of kind of slowing down ever so slightly. We are coming to the end. It's been. It's coming up to three hours at this point, so I am going to wind down and, and end the show. But it was a great discussion. We looked at lots of historical references and everything in between. Um, how beautiful is this dial? I mean, what's what's the date on this? 1972, 1601, mosaic dial, mosaic dial. That is stunning. Looks like a denim, but also has this marble effect. Looks great, right? Um, and something else I'd like to mention, it would be so nice to see Rolex bringing out an all gold date just. Am I the only one that thinks an all gold date just would be amazing? If they only ever do all gold in their president line uh, and, and they specialize in two tone, but this is just something special. Uh, it reminds me of the, the originals. I mean, the original date just as an anniversary for the date just, they should bring out a solid gold on a Jubilee 
with a tiny little bezel and make it just taste tasteful, you know? Uh, check out Lot 208 really quick. It's super interesting from Cassidy. Okay, we're getting, oh my goodness, I can't believe we're still browsing. Okay, no longer am I going to zoom in and focus on these because we're getting way into this. So we've got some more pieces. I love that brown dial. Brown on gold is superb. Uh, day dates. I'd actually like to have a look at day dates in more detail in the future. We've got some turnographs, uh, some oyster quartzes. I mean, geez, um, these turnographs are also very important uh, to the family name and again ties in with the air king and that development over time okay we're going to slowly but surely get through these uh let's see we have some more just standard oyster perpetuals a bit of a roulette dial get to the ladies pieces um wow this 19 this is a special one very interesting look at this one on the right lot nine one nine eight 1965 that is beautiful how is that and check that bracelet i mean that is some real jeweler's work right there to get the bracelet to fit that well stunning combination that really catches my attention and i think it's down to the the numerals on the dial as you would expect you know buckley dial oh there's something else there let me try and get back to the oyster courts uh it was just here these are becoming extremely popular that's and i mean it was it was spoken about by a serious collector the other day that it is a watch that is slowly but surely creeping up and that he wants to to hold on to it as long as possible. Um, he's trying to remember, so it's lot, it's lot 208, right? 208 from Cassidy. I'm gonna get there now. It's amazing. We've had a, it's been a crazy stream, gone through everything. Okay, now we get to some more vintage pieces. Let's zoom into these. From the 60s, a coin edge precision. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, the watches that came out back then, got a California, no, it's not a California dial, close. California type dial, they call it. And now we get to our bubble backs, basically. Surprised they still do them. Uh, 203, wow, look at these. This is from the 30s, very deco. I mean, if we had more time, I would I would ramble on about deco inspirations and all the details. But it's, it's crazy seeing how at the time they were doing bubble backs, but they were also making watches that had these crazy octagonal forms. Deco was all about that, that approach of strange form factors, nothing down the line and the... Uh, simple really they like to be as uh, exuberant as possible with their models and 208 that is surprisingly weird that's a universal Geneve <laughs> this is the reference so it's called a disco volante and uh, thank you for the suggestion I'm going to scroll back up and say hi and thank you uh, uh, Mr. from Cassidy thank you for the suggestion I mean it's what they were doing in this time period I think this is what can help draw the show to a close is that they were just Throwing, I mean, especially in the 50s and the 60s, it was that transitional from, from deco to um, 70s era. And that's when the watch design just went absolutely bizarre. It's crazy seeing that transition and just how these watches seem, what's, what's amazing is that most watches that we know and love today are the ones that pretty much were established in the 50s. It's crazy to think that that's the, that's the time period. And... Uh, and then we move to the next references where we see 70s and, and 60s era, try compacts. Yeah, I just can't believe there's still more watches to go. I, I was thinking that it would end and we have Universal Geneva. These pole routers are just, just awesome. They really are unique. I need to do a discussion around uh, UG. Let's see. There's so many chats. It's great that it's kind of slowed down. So everyone's listening. I don't know if you're listening to me or if you're paying attention to something else, but it's great. I, I like the idea that I can sort of keep up with everyone. This is more of an engagement show than, than wrist shot week, I'm sure most of you know. Um, gorgeous. I mean, what, what can you say about the pole router, the elements, the inspiration behind them? This, this was the exact watch used in Mad Men. No, it was a 65, I'm pretty sure. And I love it when films tie up watches to the correct time periods. I think it's very important. There's lots of that. I mean, that could be a series. That could be a live show in itself. And a few more pole routers, deluxe editions and everything else. Very vintage-esque. But I think we've passed, oh, geez, we've got Movado chronographs. How long is this? 88. My goodness. Okay, we've got a Movado chronograph from 1968. And this watch looks brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. How's that? Is this military-inspired? Uh, subsea divers chronograph. No, it is just very well looked after. Amazing, right? Uh, you just you just don't. I mean, the thing with these catalogs is that they're just <laughs> they're just so long. And then we get to I don't want to botch this. This is not a this is not an A three eight four, is it? A three eight six. Okay, good. 
<sighs> and then we get to stuff like this, and it's just like, hey, we're rushing, and then we, we get to great references like these. Zenith Alpramera, an original with its ladder bracelet and all of those little quirks that makes the watch so unique to the family. Yeah, it's just Stella, Bud Owens. And uh, in something, I'm pretty sure in something has a Zenith Alpramera. Uh, stunning. And uh, this watch really is history to itself. And it's, it's a watch that's been able to establish itself in its own realm, its own niche at this point in time in our history. And I think it's just amazing for that reason. Uh, the use of colors and everything. Did a great video on it. I had a good look at the movement and discussed everything from vibrations per hour to the race for the automatic chronograph. It was, I would say, six months ago. I spoke about the king of chronographs and looked at the evolution of Zenith and the El Primera. If you haven't seen that, I recommend it. It was a lot of fun to put together. Great history lesson. Okay, carrying on. Jeez, there's still more. More Zeniths. <laughs> Here I'm trying to reach the three-minute mark. We have a Seiko, far out, a high beat from 1969. Check that out. This watch has had a good life. Nice seeing it on a, on a rubber strap as well. You see, the thing is, these shows can just go on and on, and people complain that they're so long, but it's because there's so much to talk about, you know? Um, Revolution and Zenith, the cover girl. Yeah, and that's the A381 or 8183. I don't know what they call it. Um, I'd like to look at it a bit more. I, have, I spoke about it once or twice, we watch guy, in previous shows, I think on previous streams. Anyway, nice looking Seiko. It's cool seeing this watch in the flesh from that time period, right? And we have some Panerais. I mean, this just doesn't stop. They really have piled up the watches on their lot. This is quite the, the Piaget Polo. If we look at the, the actual clubs, I don't know if you can see this. I don't want to cause any more screen flashes if I can avoid. Oh, thank goodness. We've actually reached the end where we now have taxidermy. <sighs> okay, so we've done pretty well. We've motored through this whole lot of watches, and I think I'll leave this up for the rest of the show as I address you guys. But uh, it's been good. Like uh, I'm surprised that we were able to keep it sub three hours for a change. And I'll leave this to sort of close off the show for the evening or the morning or wherever you are in the world. But it was great. These catalogs are good because it's basically free content. It's it's just a huge list of watches that we can browse through and, and check out, all of them being historic and everything else. Junior Donton says, um, thank you. Look forward to the show every week. Oh, it's a pleasure. No, I love it. I love the fact that we get to engage. It's a time when I get to chat to all of you. And uh, as much as I try to be on the ball with replying to comments on videos and social media, I'm useless. <laughs> this is a time when I can actually address you and thank you all for joining. And I really hope that this uh, situation, if you can, one, one piece of advice is avoid all the news around it if you can. Uh, keep working from home. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, don't think about this and how it's going to impact the world rather think about how you're going to look after yourself your family and if i could give you any advice any two cents i would say get some masks get some gloves and just try your best to you know limit the spread i think the idea of of isolation is so it's it'll be amazing the, the numbers and the statistics out of this uh with regards to isolation and just how it could change the, the ballpark um, and the numbers and the spread rate and all of that. No, since we're three hours in, I might as well tell you, I have a really good friend. She lives in Amsterdam. She got it. She got the virus. I kid you not. That's that's kind of like, a st how's that for a, a showstopper? She got the virus. And she's been updating me every day since. She, she got it, I would say, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday. And she feels 100% today. And she's uh, she's 30 at this point. She's 30 years old. And it goes to show, uh, it, it is real, it's affecting people, but in saying that, don't think that it's going to affect you in a bad way. I think that the percentage of people who are gonna really struggle from this is minute compared to the world population. So yeah, like everyone's saying, stay safe, look after yourselves and uh, really take care. And I hope hope you enjoyed this show. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it's great. I'm, I'm really, it was nice hearing her story because she gave me some, some good feedback about just the symptoms and how it's all been. But it's just your typical sore throat cough and uh, fatigue, the usual kind of stuff. But it passes and she's feeling great after, what, three or four days. So there we go. And, and I wouldn't say she's someone who really takes care of herself in the scheme of things. So it's not like we're talking about someone who's super health conscious and all the rest. But in saying that, People are getting it and they're recovering. And the news isn't covering 
the recoveries. It's just recovering the bad stuff because that's what sells. Got to look past that as much as possible. Anyway, everyone, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining. It's been a great show. Uh, please look after yourselves again. Take this as seriously as possible. I think it's very important. Now is the time for people to take this seriously because it can be the difference between everything else. So really, um, that's about it, actually. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining in. Uh, Founder Time is Capital, as always, it's such a pleasure. I, I really hope you're all looking after yourselves as much as possible. And uh, Finchy, thank you, fellow industrial designer. It's great. It's great having another industrial designer on the show. There's a few that join in. And uh, yeah. Anyway, let's see from Thomas Burnett. Thank you so much for the super chat, brother. On uh, behalf of everyone, ID Tribe, say it's safe. <laughs> yeah, um, really, you guys are great. And uh, what else can I say? Um, the content come out next week, Tuesday and Thursday. I think the Smith's Everest video will be out Thursday. On Tuesday, uh, I think I'll do the P01. Uh, it's, it was a good write-up. They're all write-up related, so they're nice and in-depth. And we just keep it going from there. And I hope you enjoy the stuff that comes. Um, but as always, everyone, uh, look after yourselves. Stay safe. Thank you so much for joining. And I'll see you in the next one. I'll let you know about uh, Wrist Shot Week next weekend. And we'll see you when that happens. Cheers for now, everyone.